Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I am opening up our meeting. Oh, good. Here comes Ms. Anderson. Um, roll call. Mrs. Snyder. Ms. Matoye. Here. Ms. Fleur. Here. Ms. Black. Here. Ms. Yelsey. Here. Ms. Anderson. Here. Ms. Bartow. Here. Ms. Snell. Did she get one? Dr. Here. Bartow. Here. I don't know if she got one. Um, she got you. Do we have any cards? Seeing that we have no cards, the board is going to recess into closed session. <laughs> okay, so now we've got it. We're recalling the meeting to order. And, sorry, wait till I get down to call the meeting to order. <laughs> Opening ceremonies, we're ready for a moment of reflection and the flag salute led by Bailey. We need to adopt the agenda. Is, do I hear a motion? So move. Mrs. Mrs. Black moved and Mrs. Yelsey seconded. Do we have any discussion? Uh, I have a comment. Okay. My computer won't turn on. But no, my other comment is <laughs> I'd like to uh, pull um, agenda item um, <clears throat> 16A2 to discussion. Do you want to move to discussion or do you want to leave it where it is and have it comments? Um, it, you can still. Because if we move it to discussion. <clears throat> I thought that. Uh, then according, com if we move it to discussion action, then any comments on it will have to wait till discussion action. Um, that's not what, um, when I read the, the, uh, uh -huh. the, it doesn't say that. It says you can, you can uh, comment on anything on the agenda, even discussion action at the beginning. Okay. Okay, correct? No, it's not. No. 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 That's why everyone's upset. Yeah. Okay, just because a there's I a apologize. section section for discussion. I thought action. we went oh, okay. This is an opportunity to address the public board on action items, consent calendar resolution, consent calendar discussion, action calendar. So I guess they could do it all no. right then. Oh, but it says right underneath the word comment. Speaker cards for items on the discussion action calendar <laughs> will be held until that item is then considered by the board. Hmm. Well, it shouldn't do that, but well, um, we I will. Okay, <laughs> then I, I'm not moving it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, but we, but we want to, we want to discuss it. We want to comment on it at the time yes yes okay and then the same thing I, I'm not gonna pull it but I just have a couple of questions on uh, item 16 b3 sorry 16 b3 I just have a couple of additional questions and Kathleen will be here so okay thank you any other comments things Okay, all those in favor of adopting the agenda as comment as amended? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. 7 0. Approve adoption of the minutes of September 17th. So moved. Second. It was moved by Mrs. Floor, seconded by Mrs. Black. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Student here. board member reports. <laughs> Bailey, you may begin. Hi, everybody. I'm Bailey Bogard from Newport Harbor High School. So for an academic update so far, the seniors in our IB Diploma Program International Baccalaureate are almost done with their extended essay, which I believe to be 
it's around 5,000 words, maybe 3,000 to 5,000 words. 4,000 <laughs> words. There we go. And um, we also offer a career mentor program. So my mentor is a judge at the Santa Ana Courthouse, but that program is starting up really well, and we have our next report due on October the 14th. For our athletic update, our homecoming football game was on Friday. Our current football record is 6-0, six, six oh, so we're very happy about that. And we recently won the best student section in the OC, which is a big first for Newport Harbor. And we also had our Battle of the Bay water polo game last week. For a recent event, um, our homecoming rally was also on Thursday, and we had homecoming princesses and, and queens that were voted. And then the Hall of Fame induction was last week as well. And upcoming events, our homecoming dance, instead of one, we will be having a Harbor Fest, a music festival featuring bands um, from across campus. And our Battle of the Bay football game is on the 25th, which is a very good way for Newport Harbor to fundraise and gain support for the football program. And for another unique event that happened on campus, we had three exchange students come onto our campus from Okazaki, Japan, who shadowed three Newport Harbor students last week. Wow, that's great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Catherine? Good evening, President Matoye, members of the board, Dr. Navarro, executive cabinet, fellow student board members, and distinguished guests. I'm Catherine Pham, and I am pleased to present the following updates for Costa Mesa High School. Our homecoming theme is decided to be Astro World. Our rally is going to be held on Thursday, October 17th, and our dance is that Saturday, October 19th. Our PSAT is coming up on October 16th, and we are offering SAT group classes and boot camp from October 21st through 26th. We are also beginning our wellness workshops this week on Wednesday at lunch. Our first topic is self-care. Our first dance showcase was October 3rd and 4th, and it featured all original works by our very own Costa Mesa High School dance team. Also, our CMHS drama department is putting on The Crucible, from October 25th through 27th. And we are hosting the South Coast Invitational Band Competition on October 12th. Girls Volleyball swept Estancia 3-0 in our Battle of the Bell rivalry game. And cross country, girls cross country, won the head-to-head -head battle against all league schools in, at the Cluster League meet. Costa Mesa actually defeated the defending league champions, Santa Ana, by a score of 29 to 33. Ooh. Senior Diane Molina won the three mile race with a time of 17 minutes and 33 seconds and was followed by her teammates, freshman Kira Anderson, who took third, and also senior Vanessa Carrillo, who took fifth. For our upcoming field trips, we have an 11th grade San Francisco field trip with planned visits to UC Berkeley and also Stanford University. That's on November 20th through 22nd. And for our 10th grade field trip, we are going to Los Angeles. We're touring USC and UCLA. And we're also going to the Nat Natural History Museum. And we hosted the WASC committee and had a very successful visitation. The committee highlighted the culture and our climate. and we. Um, and we emphasize student connection and high student engagement. That's all I have for today. Thank, Thank you for having me. Fabulous. Having Thank you very much. I'm marking my calendar. They may not have <laughs> parking outside as some of these. They may. Have, well, we don't have seating for a lot of the people that are on the. No, panel. I'm talking about the other board members. Oh, the other board members. Well, we know we had a report from Estancia um, that was emailed to us, so Mrs. Snell will take care of that one. But if. If a board know. member comes later, we will be happy to have them give their report mm -hmm. if they can get through. This is very <coughs> unusual to not have told me how to review. Okay, this is a Stancia report uh, by Kenya Roca, and she is um, saying there's a free SAT boot camp this Saturday. It's mainly for seniors who are going to take the SAT in November. Uh, their girls golf won Battle of the Bell. Uh, the homecoming game will be at Mesa uh, versus Saddleback, and um, it's on the 11th. And Water Polo won the Westminster Tournament. Uh, State of the School's breakfast. ASB mm -hmm. helped set everything up the day before and the day of, and mm -hmm. met at school at 
Estancia talked about our four career pathways, which are digital media arts, construction, emergency medical academy, and project lead the way. And four students from each pathway talked about their experience. Uh, the homecoming dance uh, night at sea will be on Saturday, October 12th from 7 to 10. ASB is getting ready, making posters, prom promoting during announcements. Unity Day is October 23rd. Uh, Link Crew and ASB organize everything. What it is, is something that started last year to get all the classes to get together and hang out and we'll be watching Halloween Town and TK Burger will be provided. Club Rush is on the 15th. More clubs are signing up and ASB is making posters to promote this. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Harbor Council PTA. Okay, good evening, President Matoye, board members, Dr. Navarro, cabinet, and guests. Uh, my name is Julie Lank, Harbor Council PTA president, and I'm here to let you know Harbor Council is committed to supplying training and mentoring for all its units. Um, it is through P uh, training that PTAs become dynamic and successful. So our, our membership, as of October 1st, we have 1,289 members on totem alone. And 14 schools are currently up and running on this new program. And our grand total of membership is 1,992. So we're moving along. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, College and Career Night is October 16th uh, from 6.30 to 8.30 at the Orange County Fair events. And as you know, this is a well-attended, very informative event. And we are still in need of volunteers. We're going to do the, we're doing it the old-fashioned way and the sign-up genius. So hopefully will have enough volunteers for takedown because that's been the issue. Mm. So um, our parent education series, we had our first one on October 2nd and the topic was behavioral strategies for elementary students. And it was presented by the Newport Mesa Unified School District Autism Specialist. I attended the evening session and I tell you, I was so impressed. There was like 40 community members there and I found the team of Emily Rubenstein and Justin Micah, they were dynamic. They were really good. And I, I felt that they relate, relayed valuable parenting information to the parents. And not just autistic. You know, it, it really, I would think all elementary school uh, mm -hmm. uh, parents would want to see that. I was impressed with it. So anyways, um, and to reflections. I am very happy about this. Reflections entries are due to council on November 4th, and I'm very excited to tell you that five more schools that haven't um, been in, um, include, participated in the years before are now involved. Oh, so we have 19 schools That's participating. Amazing. And um, uh, Paula Reno, when we went to their meeting, they put it in their budget too. So, you know, it's the arts pushing, yay, pushing, yay. so yay. Get, get some more state winners representing. <laughs> and um, I'm extremely honored to announce that PTA has sponsored bill, Assembly Bill 2878, which is the Meaningful and Effective Family Engagement, and it has been signed into law. So the, um, this is important because it will add research-based family engagement practices into the California Ed Code. And also, the Late Start Bill, along with AB 1505, which is the rules governing the charter schools, um, they've both been passed by the Assembly and State, and they're um, awaiting the signature of the governor. So in closing, um, PTA really encourages, I spoke with Dr. Navarro about this, PTA <laughs> encourages us to utilize the Prop 63 mental health money. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, next on the agenda, we have a report on kindergarten readiness from Kathleen Leary. That's what it says to talk John to, but I'm sure that's Mr. Drake and Mr. Leeson. Do you have introductions? Nope, there they are. <laughs> <laughs> I could have if I needed to. <laughs> Good evening, President Matoye, board members, Dr. Navarro, executive cabinet, and guests. 
I'm very excited today to be here to discuss with you uh, kindergarten readiness as it relates to our, our early developmental index data. And I'm joined here today by, with Michelle O'Neill, who will be helping with the presentation oh. or the report. <laughs> Batman and Robin. <laughs> so um, your number one board priority addresses uh, the Common Core standards as well as your desire for kids to be sex successful in college and career. Well, we really believe that the college and career readiness begins with early childhood. Yeah. <laughs> One of the ways we look at school readiness is a instrument called the Early Developmental Index that we have been doing since 2009. Lori Hogart was one of the first, um, the first director in Orange County to have our students administer, or our teachers administer the kindergarten or the early development index. And now all districts in Orange County give the EDI. And the data is very valuable, and you'll see later on how we use the data. It is not, um, we don't get the results on an individual basis, but it is population based. And so we really look at the physical and well-being, social competence, emotional maturity, language and cognitive development, and communication skills and general knowledge of our incoming kindergarten students. Well, what can we do with the data? First of all, we do look backwards. What can we do as a department, zero to five? What, and we'll be sharing with you our action plan that we've developed, a kindergarten readiness action plan, so that we can maybe better prepare our students coming into kindergarten so that they are successful in, on the third grade SBAC. We believe that if we can um, close that readiness gap, then maybe we can close the achievement gap. We also give the data to the elementary sites so that they can look at it and their vulnerabilities. And I know some sites have adopted things like Second Step in order to address in those vulnerabilities and interventions. So if you notice, here's some of the data. This is the most recent data. Um, on, oh, this, it's not working. So on the left, in the darker green, is the uh, EDI results for NMUSD. Uh, children on track, for instance, for physical health and well-being, 80% of our children come uh, ready for kindergarten, 12% are developmentally at risk, and 8% are developmentally vulnerable. On the other side, we, you can compare it to the statistics of Orange County. And you can notice in all of the domains, we're in the 80 percentile ready for kindergarten. But then when you start to look at the um, developmental subdomains, we get a little bit clearer picture of where our kids are coming in with some vulnerabilities. And after doing some um, data analysis, we looked and we found that we're gonna really focus on gross and phone mo fine motor skills, overall competence with peers, uh, mm -hmm. communication skills and general knowledge, and pro-social and helping behaviors. <clears throat> so uh, two years ago with this data, we created a kindergarten readiness action plan. And really knowing that we know where we want the students to be. We know what they need to be doing in kindergarten to be successful. So we want to prepare them not only in our preschools, but in our community and ways that we can reach out to the community to make sure that our students are coming prepared. So Michelle is going to talk a little bit more about the data, tell you the ones that we're um, concentrating on, but also the skills that are in that subset. So when we look down, when we break down the subdomains, four of those areas that I'll be breaking down and talking to you guys about tonight is the communication skills and overall knowledge, social competencies, pro-social um, behaviors, and the fine motor and gross motor skill sets. So when we first take a look at here at the communication skills and general knowledge, 45% of, of our students are ready. That's some good news in that particular area. Although we do have areas of needs and concerns. The skill sets that we um, are breaking down in this particular area is the ability to use language effectively in English, the ability to communicate own needs in a way that's understandable to both adults and peers, um, and being able to answer questions showing knowledge about the world. So when we're breaking down these particular areas and how we're going to work toward this particular subdomain, we do that in two different ways. One of them is during our PAC time and our partnership with Think Together. So when I talk about PAC time and what PAC time is, PAC time is, oh, sorry. 
Pack time is where in our preschool classrooms, um, our teachers are working collaboratively with our families for the first 15 minutes of the day. And what they're doing, what our teachers are doing is they're modeling behaviors. They're modeling on how to teach skill sets to our families so that our families are generalizing those skill sets at home. Um, Every single month, our families, our teach, or actually our students are given a book every single month. That's a free book that's given to them in our classrooms and all our preschool classrooms. And that is to build that library so that they have a library at home as well. Um, and then the last part of that is, is that we're handing out resources to our families and handouts. So that is part of our curriculum that is going on and we're explaining that information to our families. Um, during our pack time, we're focusing on that writing and literacy and making sure that we're working on intentional teaching. Um, the books that we choose are nonfiction books to be able to help teach general knowledge and vocabulary. The second area in that general knowledge um, subdomain that we're working on is um, our action plan in working with our partnership with Think Together. Think Together, we have a group called Learning Links at two of our elementary sites, um, one at Wilson Elementary and one at Mariners Elementary. And the purpose of that is having our um, kid, kiddos from ages zero to five working with their parents and learning how to play and learning how to have those learning to learn skill sets in a classroom to prepare them. Also too, we're supporting our families in student growth. So you can see here in that physical health, that social competence, that emotional maturity, language and cognitive development and communication skills. And lastly in that area, is, most importantly, is that part parent participation, that our parents are actually participating with the teachers in that classroom to learn those particular skill sets, to be able to be ready for preschool as well as kindergarten. The next domains that we're gonna be focusing on is that social competency as well as that pro-social and helping behavior. So when we look at that overall social competency, we are 50% that our children are ready, okay? Some of the skill sets that we're looking for in that particular area is the ability to um, get along with their peers, mm -hmm. play and work cooperatively with other children, as well as showing self-confidence. The next domain is that pro-social and helping behaviors where 50% that our, kinder, our kiddos are coming in ready. And some of those areas is that children helping other children, children comforting their other peers who are sad or upset. So working on those particular skill sets. Based on the EDI data that we've gotten from our kindergarten teachers, we have incorporated second step for preschool as well as TK. So all of our teachers are trained in second step, the newer version of second step. Um, when we talk about second step, some of those four areas that we're working on is those skills for learning, which is working on that self-regulation and executive functioning. Um, empathy, being able to understand the feelings of themselves as well as their peers. Um, that other, the third one is that emotional management, learning to calm down and express their feelings. So we're practicing all of those particular skill sets already and preschool as well as in our TK programs. And lastly is that friendship and problem solving, learning to keep friends and problem solve in a positive way. So that's the curriculum, the second step that we've implemented, okay? And then that last domain, that, that subdomain that we're really focusing on, and we've gotten a lot of feedback from our kindergarten teachers is that gross motor and fine motor domain. Really, it's that fine motor domain, okay? And 57% of our children are ready in this particular area. Some of the things, the skill sets that we're working on in this particular area is the being proficient in um, holding a pen, crayon, and paintbrush, having that tripod grasp, as well as the ability to manipulate objects. Um, are those particular skill sets. And based on the EDI data, both our preschool um, classrooms as well as our TK classrooms, we've implemented handwriting without tears. And some of the things that we're working on in, in as far as the objective to handwriting without tears is teaching students to physically tackle the day. Being able to break down those skill sets, whether it's their gross motor or their fine motor skill sets. And some of those things that we're working on is helping students with basic writing. Um, holding pencils and crayons, and also to holding the scissors appropriately, mm -hmm. learning how to snip, being able to learn how to cut, okay? So those are a few things that we adopted within our, our, our preschool, um, but we also know 
that our students come from other places. 25, only 25% of our kindergarten students actually have gone to one of our preschools. We have uh, 12 sites, eight state and four tuition, but only 25% of our kindergartners have actually been in one of our preschools. So we really want to reach out to our local faith-based, our Head Starts, the CDCs, and any other local preschool programs so then we can share the EDI data and then as a group talk about best practices. And so we meet about four times a year with the local preschools. So that's part of our kindergarten action plan. Another part of our kindergarten action plan, in 2017-18 created a kindergarten readiness task force and I was having the same people at the table and I was really wanting Hogue and the city to be involved and it really wasn't working out the way I wanted to and I was lucky enough that kind of, uh, it wasn't a fluke, but together with the city of Costa Mesa and Hogue were already getting together about early childhood and we joined forces with them and so we um, have the Costa Mesa Early Ch Childhood Correlate Coalition in our first event is this Thursday. We have a launch event. We're doing the screening of No Small Matter, which is a documentary about the importance of early childhood. And really excited about this because where we can really, at the community level, really make a difference. So I'm, I'm excited about that. So those are some of our action steps based on the EDI data. And we're here if you have any other questions. Great. Mrs. Snell. Thank you. That was very informative. Um, I'm wondering, um, what is the process for collecting the EDI data, and um, is it standardized? Is there a rubric? Okay. So, good question, and I was going to address that in the very first slide. So, it, to back up a little bit, EDI comes out of McMaster University in Toronto. Mm -hmm. It's used internationally um, in some states or some countries, like New Zealand, actually use it one of their national indicators. Oh. And um, it ha it's well researched. We use it in correlation with um, UCLA. They do all the data s for us, scrubbing the data and also mm -hmm. putting it together. Mm -hmm. And it, we have a three year cycle where kindergarten teachers actually do a survey on their students. Mm -hmm. And they have, a many, you know, I think it's a hundred and something mm -hmm. questions. Mm -hmm. They're paid um, per student mm -hmm. to do this um, index. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Mrs. Fleur? Thanks, Kathleen. Um, a couple of things, um, and you mentioned it in your slide. Um, you ha we have four tuition-based, that Correct. one's located at Davis, Harborview, Newport Coast, and Newport L. Um, is there any possibility, can uh, families qualify and get, are there scholarships available for those? Because I saw that they were like $900. Well, if you put have two kids in preschool, that's eighteen hundred dollars a month. That's a quite a. Preschool and some of really them are nine hundred sixty. That's for the full day, and it drops down from there. So, is there is there are there scholarships? At available? this point, we don't have any scholarships. We can explore the possibility of doing those. Okay, and then I um, have three. Where are the uh, child development centers? We have several sites that have child development, and do we work with them at all? We do. They partner with us. They come to our local preschool meetings. Um, they are at Lindbergh, at Newport Heights, Woodland, and I think that's it. Okay. And um, later on, I, and I'll ask you now because it'll get my questions answered, um, we are approving a, a move for the Think the, with the Think Together Correct. Um, to put it at Mariner's Elementary School, and yet Mariner's Elementary School has no preschool, and I notice that there is virtually, other than a tuition, full tuition-based program at Newport L, and there's the, the one at Whittier, there is no other preschool opportunity within See, yeah. the, the Newport uh, within the harbor zone. In the harbor zone. And, and, and based on some additional information that we were provided, that's one of the areas that is of major, I mean, mm -hmm. in okay. terms of looking at the data, that's where we need to place one. Is, so is the, is the intent when we move the Think Together program to uh, Mariners? Because where where are these parents going to come from Thank you. with that their kids? I, mean, I was I'm waiting going, for well, where, there's, there's there's where are the kids going to come from? <laughs> That's a good question. They don't but have any place to. There, there's no preschool there, and there's no. We're <laughs> advertising it throughout Newport Harbor zone, so all the schools there. If they have any students zero to five, they can bring their child mm. to Mariners. 
but where are they going to go? I mean, there's so it's a like classroom there that we have a thing together that has set it up so that they can to they're going to they have activities and things that like similar to what we do in PACT where they're really encouraging the social interaction, building vocabulary and um, you know, building those interaction uh -huh. skills uh, and where they're doing it alongside think to get think together staff and there's a teacher and two um, workers from AmeriCorps that work with them. So will they come every day? No, it's only two days a week, Monday and Wednesdays from one to four. Okay. So I hope that we'll put on the, in future, is to look at placing a, one of our, one of our preschools in that zone, because I think we need to have at least one in, e in each zone. Is this okay. the concern zone? <laughs> well, not, in not, in, not in the harbor zone. Correct. Other than here Whittier. is the harbor zone. Yes, I know, but it's pretty far away. And if I could just clarify a little bit, our data that we look at, we had the four areas that we found vulnerabilities. Every single school in our district, both in Costa Mesa and Newport Beach, they all have the same vulnerabilities. It might not okay, be to the same extreme, but we picked those four because it's it's across the board. Okay. And That's I great. will call on you, but I have a quick question on Martha's question. Is CDC, do they have a pre K program so that CDC at Woodland and Heights, Heights, Heights. So those are preschool programs and Lindbergh in that zone, in that harbor zone. So there are some. Those they're are just paid. not ours. They're not ours. Right. They're not ours. Right. They're not ours. Okay, Miss Anderson. Thank you for your presentation. This was the first time I met Kathleen was at an, a kindergarten readiness meeting, and so I'm so excited about um, all of. The, the work that you have both put in. Um, would you mind emailing us the most recent EDI map? Because I know sure. for me that was really informative. Um, and I love to see, particularly for West Side, we saw, oh my gosh, the emotional readiness, all of those components were so high. Mm -hmm. And so to be able to share that with parents and to share the assets rather than just, just the vulnerabilities the, yes. was mm -hmm. really huge. So if you could email all of us the Absolutely. most recent one, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Ms. Bartow, Mrs. Bartow, sorry, um, I just didn't, I didn't want to unmarry you. That's okay. <laughs> um, actually, I was gonna ask for the map too, so that's really helpful. Thank you so much, I love seeing this. Um, I wanted to say how it's so interesting to watch year over year how the needs change, how that pro-social keeps growing, but how the fine motor skills have started to crop up again. I think a few years ago, that wasn't such a concern. <laughs> um, it's interesting to watch year over year, like just based on what kids are experiencing in their environment. So thanks. Well, this isn't fine motor, right? When you're right, on exactly, <laughs> exactly. That's <laughs> true. Yeah. Okay, my turn. Um, Mrs. Floor had another question and was what curious. At what school? We also have preschool for our special ed pro for our special ed programs. Frequently, it's for um, children with autistic like behaviors, but I don't know if we have more than that. But we also have, in addition to the gen ed preschools, we also have. How, how many do we have do you, off uh, the top of your head? Are you talking about the Starfish classrooms? Sure. So the Starfish yeah. classrooms we have at Adams and at Harbor View. So um, we do have peers participating in those particular programs as far as the Starfish and the Seahorse. But we have all oh. of our special ed preschool classrooms all have peers in those particular classrooms. And they are spread across our entire district. So when you're talking about... Um, all the different classrooms we have at Sonora, we have at, um, I, know. I can't even name them all. All those other eight. Yeah. yeah. I mean, okay. they, they are spread across our district as far as having um, peers mm -hmm. participating in our autism or ADHD classrooms. Here are the, here are the Plus, classrooms. oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, and one of the exciting things is we're really trying to break down those silos, mm -hmm. and we're doing PD with our gen ed teachers, preschool teachers, and our special ed preschool teachers. Mm -hmm. And that's so good. Yeah. They're so, it's so successful. Our preschool programs are amazingly successful. Um, and my other question was, do we have data on how many of our kindergarten students went to preschool, period? Because just because we didn't supply it. I mean, it's a nice, easier transition if they're coming with a curriculum that blends. But a lot of our kids, they're so, there are so many preschools that still gives them a heads up over the child that didn't get to go to any preschool Sometimes I don't want to give any moms or dads that do an amazing job. Mm -hmm. but. I can um, run that data and give that to you. Yeah, bottom line, no, is you have that data. Yes. Okay. Yeah, it'd be nice, but 
in your spare time, that's not a re okay. demand and request. Yeah. It's yeah. just mm -hmm. good. Miss mm -hmm. Anderson, more? Yes. <laughs> um, would you please explain to you about the state preschools, who is available, who is able to come to that? And then also the location and the date for the um, film screening. Oh, thank you. Um, so for our state pre preschools, we actually have two types of state preschools. We have part day, which the students either go AM or PM, and that's all based on income eligibility. Um, and then we have a full day, full year program, which they go all day, and they go 246 days. So through wow. winter break, you know, they have Christmas and Christmas Eve off and New Year's Eve, New Year's. <laughs> day off, but they go 246 days. Um, and that's not only based on income, but need. So a parent must have be working or um, disabled or going to school or homeless. There's a lot of different categories for qualifying for need. Mm. But those are some of the, um, and we have them at eight sites. And then our um, No Small Matter is at the uh, library, the new library in Costa Mesa and it starts at 6 p.m. Just get there a little bit early. We are going to be serving a light dinner, oh. and um, currently we have a little bit over 90 people that have signed up, so it's exciting. You're going? You're going? And that's on October 10th. This Thursday. Thursday. And they said that when the invitation came out that there was no charge, but they need yep. to know how many people are coming to, to set up chairs so that to set up we, chairs and to buy the dinner and oh and to make sure that the fire department <laughs> doesn't get mad if we <laughs> overfill the room. Um, do you have a rough count? of how many students we serve for preschool, roughly? Um, for the, we're a little, about 420 for our, our state, and then tuition, <laughs> about 125 in our. And then our spe special ed, I mean, we. I, I, I couldn't answer for special ed. It's about uh, 250, 260. Thank you, so we're, we're serving, we're getting close to 1,000 children, mm -hmm. so. Good for us. <laughs> Thank you for a really thorough report. I really appreciate it. We all do. Thank you, Thank you so yes, much. All righty. Informal reports. Dr. Navarro. Okay. I hope I don't steal anyone else's report, but oh. I did want to uh, report to you that uh, I was able to attend the WASC readout for Costa Mesa mm. High School, <laughs> and I see John and uh, <laughs> so, so, Russell and Kurt, so, so I will not steal all their thunder, uh, but I will tell you, I I, the highlight for me was the, the uh, social emotional aspect of the report. I think if you're a counselor or an activities director at Costa Mesa High School, I think you should feel like you got an A++ on that report because it was amazing how the committee found that uh, the students uh, felt valued, they felt that they were welcome, they felt that the, the staff cared about them, and they felt safe at the school. So I think, uh, you know, I think that was, that was for me the highlight. I'll leave the rest for the other gentlemen to share with you because there were many, many more highlights. The thing that I liked the best when they announced it was it wasn't just the ASB students who are practically perfect in every way. Just letting you guys know. Uh, it wasn't, they asked, they asked for a broad spectrum of all kinds of students that went right. to this school. So there was even one of the students there that was in no other activities other than going to class. So the information came back from a broad spectrum of kids and not just the ones that we would expect. The cheerleaders should be cheering the school. I mean, that's, that's typical. So I was yeah. pretty proud that. And it's OK that you'll hear more because there was a lot well, in the report. there was a lot to be said. Good. Well, good evening. What I'd like to share with you tonight um, is an update on our new teacher induction program. We haven't talked about it for a very long time. Some people remember this as being BITSA. And you might, you might have also heard the stories of the binders, the multiple, multiple <laughs> binders that people had to put together. Uh, well, it really, truly has evolved um, over the years, and we're really proud of our participation with the Orange County Department of Ed. So with um, the facilitation of Megan Brown, our Director of Certificated Personnel, and our two fantastic induction leads, Amy Tupa and Sarah Bartell, they oh. coordinate the program. And this year, we have approximately 75 teachers Ooh. who are, that is split, and some are first year, some are second year. As you know, it is a two-year program. And we have a wonderful group of mentors who truly enjoyed, and we, got, we received 
really strong feedback that the training that OCDE did this year, and it too, the training itself has evolved, was very good. And then reciprocated, OCDE was very impressed with the quality of our mentors and their participation level. And so we're very, very proud of that. They're a um, wonderful group of people to be bringing our young folks along. So the program involves um, one hour a week where they are working with their mentor directly, just one-on-one, -on -one at their, and they schedule their time. And whereas in the past, the, the program and what the state expected was a lot of um, task-oriented activities. Now there is a shift of working with people new to the profession on the moral support, the social emotional piece, and, and working through all of that. So there's a little bit of shift there. And then once a month, there is an induction um, session where the mentors are working all in the same room with their new teachers, and then Amy and Sarah are facilitating and assisting with that work. So the program's come a long way. We're very excited to be able to offer that to our new teachers. And um, the first session was just last week and very well attended and received. Otto Zeresny and I will give, be giving you a report a little bit later in the agenda on the schematic design for the Estancia Theater, so I'll leave it for that this Ooh. evening. <laughs> Good evening, just two things. Um, First of all, uh, we're looking forward to a, um, a payroll supervisor interview here on the 16th, so that's, right, that's really good news. And, um, and we're also going to be um, looking at the time and attendance. As you can imagine, over 2,000 employees uh, uh, capturing all of their time for payroll can, <laughs> is a, is a far-flung process. And with uh, Mr. Holcomb's leadership and his support, we're gonna start mapping that process out and looking at ways that we can make that more streamlined and, and make the process uh, more user friendly. And then um, UCLA, just for your information, uh, their lead economist uh, came out with their forecast and they're highlighting some warning signs for the future. Um, they've they've uh, indicated the trade wars and inverted yield curves and those kinds of things are are flashing some red, red uh, signals there and so they're um, they're saying that the recession risk remains high for the second half of 2020. So we just want to remain uh, sober about the future and, and be careful about that. So thank you. Okay, I'd like to provide an update regarding two um, exciting ribbon cutting celebrations that are going to occur with the Boys and Girls Club of uh, Central Orange Coast. Uh, the first one is going to be at the Costa Mesa location, which is adjacent to Kaiser Elementary School. That event is going to be October 15th, starting at 9.30. Uh, the program will begin at 10 o'clock on October 15th. And it's really to celebrate a $2.5 million investment in the facility. Uh, many different types of uh, upgrades. A few of them are going to be uh, three STEAM labs, and that is short for science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. Um, with those three labs, one will be a preschool center, one is going to be a kindergarten center, and the other one is going to be a maker space. Uh, on top of that, there's uh, the refinished the gym floors. There are going to be new bleachers, backboards, wall pads, and new fitness equipment. Um, they're completing the new roof, landscaping, and air conditioning in the facility. So that's, uh, again, October 15th. Um, program begins at 10 o'clock. The second one is going to be at the Newport Beach location, which is adjacent to East Bluff Elementary School. And that event is going to be October 23rd. Uh, it will start at 3.30, and the program will actually begin at 4 o'clock. That's to celebrate a $2 million investment in the facility. A lot of new technology, furniture, equipment. There are going to be uh, four STEAM labs, one kindergarten center, one maker space. Um, there they pu actually put in new uh, floors for the gym on top of new bleachers, bla uh, backboards, wall pads, and fitness equipment. Also a new roof, landscaping around the facility, and air conditioning. So a lot of uh, exciting uh, technology for the students. I won't get into the laundry list of things that are gonna be offered to the students, but uh, we really do celebrate our partnership with the Boys and Girls Club of Central Orange Coast, and I would like to 
um, acknowledge Robert Santana, who is the chief executive officer, and he has really helped move mountains um, uh, in regards to supporting our students uh, after school, and this is uh, going to be a wonderful addition for the community in, in Newport Beach and Costa Mesa. Wow. As all of you well know, there are many, many things going on in our secondary schools every night and every day, but I just wanted to kind of focus in on two that I went to last week. One Bailey talked about briefly, but the fifth Hall of Fame in induction at Newport Harbor High School, they were, there were six students or six alumni and two teachers ranging from graduating in 1947 to 1985, and it was across the gamut. There was a uh, music producer, there was an architect, there was a gentleman who had been in a construction field, there was a, a guy that had been a, a, a world champion motocross rider who was an actor, uh, and there was a judge. So there were a, a wide range of people. But the thing that really struck me is they all, in all of their stories and all their remembrances of their time in high school, they could all point back to a teacher or a coach or an administrator, somebody along the way that encouraged them and, then, and that supported them. Some of them were top students and some of them were not. Some of them really struggled in high school, but they really pointed to that that specific person that they named by name that really helped them during that time. I think that's something for all of us to remember. The other one was the morning of October 2nd at the State of the Schools breakfast. Those four students from Estancia High School that got up there and talked about their <coughs> pathways were so articulate and energetic and awe-inspiring and talking about their future. I mean, it just makes you want to go back and take those classes in high school. They were, they were truly the, the stars of that show as well as it should be. Um, two things that I want to point out to you, uh, Monday night, October 21st, is the Pursuing Victory with Honor uh, training at 6.30 Sanborn. I know some of you have already rsvp to that. Uh, Commissioner, uh, CF Southern Section Commissioner Rob Wygod will be there to lead it. And for the first time, we will have middle school athletic directors and coaches as well, involved as well. The last thing is the Human Relations Task Force. Our meeting will be Wednesday, uh, October 23rd. We are right now going through the vetting process with our sites and with our board to look at implementation of these recommendations. One of the things we talked about from the beginning is we weren't gonna have trouble finding things to do. The, the, the issue was gonna be honing down to the right things. And again, looking through the lens of what do we have time to do for our students and our staff, and also looking at money. So we're going through that, through the vetting process to figure out the things that we can implement from those recommendations. And we'll be doing that uh, on 1023. Good evening. Uh, I'm also gonna share a little bit about the WASC uh, visit at Costa Mesa High School. Uh, I had the opportunity to spend a decent amount of time uh, with the committee, both uh, introducing, getting to know them, as well as you know, a sit down for about an hour, answering some questions about program, uh, curriculum instruction, uh, along with some special ed staff um, uh, during the week. Uh, each, and then also was there for the final report, um, which was very, um, very positive uh, towards just about everything going on at Costa Mesa High School. Um, every single time that, that I was able to meet with the committee, they always started with what Dr. Navarro started with, um, which was really a, a culture and a climate at that, at that site that's inclusive, um, that's about the kids, uh, and about providing them multiple opportunities, both academically as well as career, as well as connecting uh, with the school. Um, all of those were highly uh, high commendations that they received. Um, in the same sense, uh, the, a, a tremendous amount of work went into the self-study uh, that, that uh, Jake Haley, uh, Eugene Kwong, and the whole uh, WASC committee put in um, to the process leading up to the actual visit, where they really kind of get in and look at their program critically. Um, so the, the supports needed moving forward are not a surprise to them. They're exactly what they found um, in relation to really looking uh, um, to, to build stronger um, uh, structures and support for our EL, and also even um, some more inclusive structures for our special ed group. Um, not a surprise. Those are exactly what the, the self-study seemed to find as well, that those are areas to move, uh, move forward and, and create action plans for. Um, and both Dr. Haley and Kwong uh, promise that that is their work. Um, they know they have it cut out for them, but they also have um, an entire staff now 
uh, really on the same page in relation to the work that needs to be focused on and done over the next several years. So high commendations from the WASC, uh, WASC committee um, and really great job uh, to the Costa Mesa staff. In the area of safety, I want to highlight something that's coming up real soon. Uh, it is the annual Great California Shakeout Drill. And this year it's on Thursday, October 17th at 10:17 a.m. Uh, our sites and our district office here has been working hard to prepare. And a phrase that I, I've actually stolen from the city of Costa Mesa, who is really promoting preparedness, is to be prepared and not scared. And that's a message that I've been repeating uh, with groups that I've been talking to. Really, the idea is that the more prepared we are, the less anxiety we feel, the less fear that we feel, and the more empowerment we gain. So, uh, so sites are working hard to get ready for the drill. I do want to let you know that when we do this district-wide, we're also going to be activating our district EOC. We'll be activating our special emergency teams, and we'll be testing ourselves as well as all the folks at the school sites. We're also doing something unique this year. During the Great Shakeout, we are going to also do a district-wide parent communication drill using our emergency communication system, Titan. So we've, we've done one before, but we're actually doing this one while we're doing the earthquake drill. Oh, yeah. And I thought that would be a great opportunity to really practice, because if we did have a disaster, and we're evacuating kids, we're also communicating with parents at the same time. So uh, we're encouraging all parents to make sure that they're updating their emails, updating their cell phones, making sure their cell phone number is in the right field <laughs> so that when Titan calls and wants to send them a text message, they're doing it on their cell phone and not their home phone. So it's gonna be an exciting day and always, always, always we will learn from our experiences. Russell, are, they, are we expecting the parents to respond to the no. drill? The, uh, the parent message is a broadcast message. Okay. So that is one way. If you can imagine, we, don't, <laughs> we can't God, have two, oh two ways here. <laughs> We've got thousands and thousands of parents. So okay. it's just keeping the parents informed. Good. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. So I wanted to follow up a little bit on what Julie was talking about earlier in terms of the um, the parent education series. And um, I did hear good reports about the first one, and I appreciate that. You know, it, it they we're trying to make them pretty broad so that they do. Um, uh, they, it's applicable to a lot of students and a lot of families. And I think this next one, which is stress and anxiety, um, it, it will, will touch a lot of families and a lot of students. And that one is being presented by Dr. Mark Lerner, and he is the physician consultant that we have in our district. So he's familiar with our district and our kids and our families, and I think that helps kind of tailor a presentation uh, appropriate for, for our parents um, about their students. And the, the first one is October 17th. That's a 9 to 10.30 in the morning here in the Sanborn building. And then we have the evening presentation from 6 to 7.30 is, in, is on October the 23rd. And again, we have um, a bilingual translation uh, for both of those, and then we also have child care at the evening presentation. So, I'm sorry, that's also at Sanborn. Sanborn. They're okay. both in Sanborn, the 23rd, the 23rd, October 23rd. That's also the cast. <laughs> And in the same room, the 17th is the uh, Great American Shakeout yes. at the same time. <laughs> yes, we've, it we've, we've already talked about that, uh, of how we're going to shake them out so they can still get training. It's so. actually kind of fun if you've never so, done it. Because so. one of them... Up, update us with invitations, if you will. <coughs> yes, please. Sure. Please. Thank you. That'll help. Yeah. Okay. Community input on action items. Okay, this is, I don't have my cheat sheet, so <laughs> this is an opportunity for the public to address the board on action items, consent calendar, resolution consent calendar, discussion action calendar. Per board policy, 9323, each individual speaker will have three minutes and speakers may not cede unused minutes to other speakers and there is a maximum of 20 minutes of comments per topic. With board consent, the 
president may increase or decrease the time allowed for public comment, depending on the topic and the number of persons wishing to speak. Hmm. The board, staff, or members of the public may request that a specific item on the consent be moved to discussion action. <clears throat> request to move consent items must be received prior to the time the board takes action on the consent calendar. All comments are recorded in full on the meeting video, the meeting's video record. When addressing the board, it is helpful if you state your name and address for the record. Thank you. Mrs. Snell has a comment, but before you comment, would you please ask Mr. Woods and Mr. Aha uh, Sinacody? Sinacori. Sinacori. Thank you. I they're Actually, they're, they're in the lobby, and I would like um, NMFT to know that as a board, or at least I can see, I totally recognize that the patio is full of blue shirts and that I'm assuming they are out in the lobby too because I can only hear and my, my abilities to see through walls stopped when I ceased being a teacher. So um, before I call up our two comment people, though, we had item number 16A2 for discussion or would you like them to talk? And no, I, no. I, I just wanted to um, let our security officer know there are some seats up in front. Oh. And if people want to sit, I think there's what, three, four? Two. 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 Okay, well, yeah. I just hate to see people leave when there's seats. Right. Okay. That's all. Thank you very much you for that. So I will start with Mr. Woods. Item 12A. 16A. On right? Item 16A2. Good evening, trustees. Um, thank you for allowing me to come speak about, uh, I'm speaking on behalf of AYSO Region 97 and Coast Mesa United uh, in regards to the Mangate removal at Ensign Intermediate School, um, middle school. Um, I, I did send emails to each of the board members and thank you for receiving those. I got uh, confirmations back. Um, but I kind of wanted to make part of the public record and uh, Put this I, I think this is all part of this discussion mm -hmm. um, so AYSO's policy is that children have to be supervised all the time and so access direct directly to fields helps us greatly in uh, making that happen what happens with us is if children are dropped off at the front of the school no parents will not park and walk their kids all the way to the field from the front of the school if they if, mm -hmm. if for a single point of entry um, most will, but some will not. But inevitably, you're going to have seven-year-olds going through the entire campus of Ensign Middle School if they remove the man gates. So those kids are unsupervised um, by parents or the AYSO coach during that entire time. Of course, unsupervised children is opening the door to uh, accidents, extra trash, va uh, uh, vandalism. And I don't know if anybody had even thought about it, but I did mention it in my email that um, inevitably, you're going to have kids that are going to be late to their practice. You might have some wet concrete, some wet asphalt, and those kids are going to be wearing cleats running through that school to get to that field on time. Um, that's an accident waiting to happen. Um, uh, of course, there's the convenience issue. You're going to have uh, grandparents trying to get to games on Saturday. It's going to be a long walk for people to go all the way around through the school to get to these fields. Um, and how do I say this? <laughs> um, I don't see, so if this choice, I'm trying to figure out who's driving this. If this is a requirement, you guys are like not allowed to keep these man gates. Okay, that is what it is, but give us somebody to point a finger at because I'm here, <laughs> I work closely with, with some of you and I'm always trying to look out for how to tell people that you guys are really trying and trying to do a good job. But on this one, I've got to have a finger to point because I'm going to have a lot of parents coming to me saying, what are they doing? Mm. And if I say, hey, it's the state is making them do it. OK, great. Yeah. But if this is something that is a decision that the, the district is making, I don't see a lot of upside for you guys, but I see a lot of downside. I got 14 seconds left and my phone's ringing, sorry. <laughs> um, but I, I think it may be an unnecessary black eye. So uh, if at all possible, please allow the man gate uh, option to remain. And even if that means pulling the agenda item to review for uh, what the specification is. But thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank thank you. you. Mr. Sinicori. <coughs> Good 
Good evening, board members. Uh, my name is Mike Sinecore. I live in West Newport. Um, I wasn't planning on speaking, but I got here and didn't see anybody else uh, in the audience to speak. I know you've gotten probably some emails on the incident issue. Um, you know, I don't need to stand here in front of you. You all do a great job. You do a lot of things for the school and the kids, and, and I personally greatly appreciate all your efforts. Um, sort of a thankless job. So that said, but um, from my perspective, I've got a, a junior now uh, that's gone through Ensign, and I have an eighth grader. So really, at Ensign, you sort of, you know, I got two years there. By the time you're getting engaged with Ensign, well, you're out the door. <laughs> so really, who cares? Um, so I've been through it twice now. And I'm an engineer, and for those that don't know, I, I work for the city. Mm -hmm. And I do a lot of projects in and around the school. And I don't want to mix the apples and oranges between what I do for my job. But looking at on campus of, God, I could do this and I could do that. There's a lot of money being spent on this fencing and parking lot project. And I'm not sure if everybody's really engaged on it and they really know what's happening. And maybe especially in the front of the school where you're bulldozing a bunch of trees. If it's a security fence, OK, got to have a security fence. Changing all the traffic flow and how things are moving on Cliff Drive and in a single point of access, I don't know if that's going to work. I think it's going to create a lot of chaos. And mm -hmm. there are a lot of other needs on that campus. And if there's any way to be able table the parking in the front, since I think the parking in the back is going to actually solve the parking problem from when I'm, what I'm seeing out there, um, and maybe use that money to maybe uh, synthetic turf between the classrooms, clean up the dirt, clean up some of the sidewalks on the campus. I, I could come up with a list and a half, but I'm leaving in June, and I won't <laughs> care at that point. But I thought oh. I at least <laughs> yes, come down here and will. say I do care today, and you know I think there could be a better you know study of what we're doing here with the money. And I I don't know how much time and effort's been out there talking to the community and you know sort of asking the question, what could we do here? Could we do something better? Is this is this what we're doing really going to fix the problem that we're trying to solve? So. I just thought I'd come down here and stick my neck out in the line and probably make some people <laughs> mad. I don't mean to. I've never met Mr. Holcomb, and I apologize for our, my attitude towards you at the public meeting. I thought you were a consultant, so <laughs> I just <didn't> apologize. <laughs> oh, we know where those are. Oh. <laughs> and that's it. That's I all I'll leave with. So thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for your comments. Mrs. O'Meara. Party? Yes? Mm -hmm. she 16 D. Eight, Wrong nine, one. and ten. That's sixteen. No, it's still. Okay. Oh, okay. That's con. That's mm -hmm. consent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yes, it that's is. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, good evening. Good evening. Sixteen. Uh, D, Dr. Eight, Navarro nine, and President Matoya. Uh, on many agendas, I've noticed uh, settlement agreements paid to parents to settle, probably in most cases, special education lawsuits. Tonight's three payments total fifty-two thousand one hundred and fifty dollars. To settle these lawsuits, there are many other expenses including lawyers to the district that they have to hire, time spent by the psychologists, all the teachers, all the support staff, all the testing, all the times they meet. All of this is very time consuming and very expensive. The total cost would probably triple that measly $52,000. For your information, Garden Grove is doing something interesting this year. They have a behavioral specialist for every special education classroom and one for every school. Maybe Newport Mesa needs to think outside the box to resolve these high profile cases at the earliest date. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. Dr. Jockham, could you just give a little background? Background that you could? Mm -hmm. Um, I can't comment on the um, specific nature, and I don't think that's what you're asking for in terms of, of the reasons that we that we um, settle these specific cases. Um, um, there, we have things for various reasons. Um, some of it is we we don't have the appropriate program. Some of it is we didn't um, do what we needed to do somewhere along the line. Um, and But I'm interested and I will reach out to my friends in Garden Grove and see what they have going on um, and see if it's if it's making a difference for them in terms of, of due process. What we do find, we look at the data all the time when we have a, any type of um, due process case to try and see if there's any patterns. Is it certain disabilities? Is it certain placements? And it's really all over the place. So, um, I, but I will reach out and see what we can find out. Could you also speak a little bit about dispute resolution? 
Yeah, so, and so we are, um, we've moved forward this year with really trying to endorse what we call informal dispute resolution. <laughs> and um, what it is, is before you get to filing that formal due process, um, it's allowing uh, a family, so anyone can call for a dispute resolution, a family, a teacher, a site administrator, and it's an opportunity to come together um, with someone in my office and really try and resolve the issue. So what happens is the school site team uh, is obligated to offer what they believe is the free appropriate public education, the FAPE. Um, and sometimes what people are looking for, it's it's a little different. It may not be you know a, a total one. 80, but they're looking for something different. And this allows the site, a site person, a site representative, site principal to come uh, to IDR, the family, and um, a lot of these settlement agreements were as a result of IDR versus, um, and then we're not typically paying attorneys, we're doing them internally. So that's another step towards you know, reducing a lot of that. Thank you. Eleanor Rebard? Which one? What number? President Batorier, school board members, executive cabinet, and audience. My name is Eleanor Rebard, and I live at 2915 Beacon Street in Newport Beach. And I did attend the Ensign um, security fencing meeting. And I felt that Doc, um, Mr. Holcomb answered the concerns that were raised at that meeting, and he also stated that if changes needed to be made, they would be made with the board's approval. And that's how there I feel. <laughs> there you Thank go. you. Um, I have a question from someone who I, I'm hoping I can read your name, and I'm hoping you're not in the lobby. But I can tell you, you live at 420 Kings Road. That helps. <laughs> Thank you. Is it Constance? No, it's Carol Ann. Oh, okay. Carol Ann. Thanks, Carol Ann. I live at Kings Road, and I gave you my okay. phone number. <laughs> yes, you did, but I didn't need to share that one. And you said item number 17 was... Well, I believe that's the one about the fence. And okay, it was whatever. 16, so Mrs. Mm -hmm. Rebert, yes. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. That, if I nope, you're good. Um, um, just to, before we start the clock, for the general public's notice, when, when we get different sets of agendas. Sometimes the number changes when it actually gets printed, so just as long as you know your item number. Okay, well. Thanks. You're actually 16A2, but okay. we're good. Thank mm. you. Um, I will share with you that I just found out about this um, at three o'clock this afternoon. Mm. Um, my husband, who is out there, is the president of the Cliff Haven Homeowners Association, mm -hmm. and he got many phone calls today mm -hmm. about the unhappiness of the people that live on Cliff Drive. And I'm sure y'all can understand why that they would be unhappy. Um, I was hoping that y'all could take some of that land, which you have a lot of, and build a large U-shaped driveway and a little path, and the kids could go off to school safely, get dropped off, and their parents could egress and then speed through our neighborhood. <laughs> which I can assure you they all do. <laughs> and they um, absolutely have no respect for a stop sign. Mm -hmm. And I have spoken to the police and the parking guys, and one guy finally said, Carol, you just got to quit. Mm -hmm. You got to quit. Somebody's going to shoot you. <laughs> well, I'm old and they're not going to shoot me. <laughs> but the best idea that the neighborhood would approve of would be a U-shaped drop-off driveway. Wouldn't cost you a whole lot of money. And it would make it a lot safer for the kids because there are no crossing guards on Cliff Drive. There is nothing. And, mm -hmm. and I can share with you, I walk my dog in the morning and it's a free-for-all. Mm -hmm. The kids don't pay any attention to crossing areas. They're going everywhere. And that won't change, just so you know. It's going to be just as ugly as it is. So please take a, take a few weeks and rethink this, because you're not going to make the neighbors happy. Already, they deal with people parking in front of their driveways, in front of their mm -hmm. houses, their 
double parking, dropping kids off in the middle of the street. We deal with those things. But it's only going to get worse if you continue doing this. Think about a U-shaped driveway. You have lots of land. I know you, they're precious to you, and it's very important to you. But a U-shaped driveway, mothers and fathers can drop their kids off mm -hmm. it, with some safety. They won't be running across the street. And ultimately, you can save lives. Right now, you're just going to, if you'll excuse me for saying it this way, and I apologize, you're just going to piss the neighbors off. <laughs> and, and you don't want that. My kids went to school there. I live on King's Road. They use King's Road, just so you know, because it has no stop signs, so they could speed down it. The mm. speed limit is 25 miles an hour and they speed up to 50 miles an hour, and they like to screech around the corner. I know, my time's up. What? But I'm old, I can Thank have you. three more minutes. No, you can't. Because <laughs> I'm old too, so no, you can't. <laughs> you are not as old as me. <laughs> Thank you so much. Dr. Navarro. Please, stop and consider. Give it some more time. This is not the right answer. Thank you. And this is from the entire neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And there are only, 400 houses. Okay. I know, I know. Go away. We don't have hooks, but you get the picture. <laughs> Thank well, you so much. Go out and let my husband come in. And okay. You're going to get to hear him oh. too. <laughs> well, but he's cute. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, we, we have no more cards, but Thank you. we did. Thank you very much. Dr. Navarro, can you speak to this, please? Uh, yes. Well, first of all, I want to thank please. all the speakers. You were kind uh, yes. and, uh, and you were uh, accurate is in your comments about what your feelings are and what your thoughts are. Um, I do want to let everybody know that this is a research issue. This is not something that we just make up. This is not a Fred Navarro brainstorm. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, researched and we work with experts. And so I'm going to take my superintendent's report time and ask Mr. Holcomb, who has some team members here who worked on this, to share some information. So Mr. Holcomb? Can you also clarify what we're voting on tonight? May I ask Oops. a quick question? No. No, no, not really. We're really good about letting people talk for their three minutes, but no. Mrs. Holcomb live on King's Road? Mrs. No, she doesn't. Yeah, but if you would. Don't tell me to shut up. Dr. thank you. shut up for two months. So the board may remember that this project is now about a year and a half old. Uh, approximately a year and a half ago, uh, the board asked us to put together a team to study the security of all of our sites after having improved the security at seven of our elementary schools uh, over the last year, it was time to take another look. And, uh, and also given the state of, uh, of our world and, and where we are. So we did, uh, we brought on a consultant uh, who has expertise in security issues, uh, Mr. Vlad Anderson. Uh, Mr. Anderson was a school resource officer here in the district for over 12 years and uh, very well respected in the community and has done a lot of research during that time on crime prevention through environmental design. So Mr. Anderson and, uh, and myself and architects went and walked uh, all of our sites, all 34 of our sites. We walked all of the sites, we walked the perimeters. We looked at each one of them to determine what vulnerabilities each site might have and what we could do to uh, maintain uh, the safest possible environment for our students and our staff. As a result of that, we came back to you with recommendations for security standards for the district. Uh, and each one of those uh, were school by school, talked about the SEPTED principles, the crime prevention through environmental design principles that Mr. Anderson uh, walked us through. And as a result of those, there was a basic uh, pre-schematic uh, layout for each one of the sites that talked about issues like the fact that if we reduce the numbers of entries as, uh, as far as is recommended uh, across the nation, which is to a single entry, if at all possible, uh, that to do that would create issues with regard to parking uh, because our staff uh, wouldn't necessarily be able to park 
uh, close to where the entrance is. A perfect example of that is the Ensign campus. Mm -hmm. So uh, as we went through that, we looked at the district sites. Uh, one of the things that we did immediately last summer uh, at your direction was we uh, installed temporary fencing at Ensign so that we wouldn't have people be able to as easily walk straight onto our site because you may recall that prior to that time, uh, you could walk onto the site unchallenged. No one would know uh, if you were to walk onto that site. Uh, that temporary fencing was there and your directive was to proceed uh, with due haste to come up with a permanent solution. Uh, we brought on board an architect for that and made a presentation to you of the schematic design showing all of the entries and the parking last December. Uh, at your December 11th meeting where we communicated uh, those SEPTED principles and, uh, and there were renderings that showed what it would look like, uh, that it was going to be a beautiful uh, a decorative fence uh, around our buildings. Uh, we talked about some of the main principles such as uh, going to a smaller diameter hole in the chain link fencing so that uh, students can't use the holes to climb it uh, with their toes mm -hmm. in their shoes, those types of things. We talked through those issues last December, and on the basis of that approval, we proceeded with the design. This is, by the way, the standard practice that you've asked us to do, which we'll be doing tonight for the theater project. Uh, the theater project schematic design is on your agenda tonight so that you're aware of it, so that then we can spend the real money in design, which is after we have the schematic design approved, then it costs thousands upon thousands of dollars to have architects and engineers complete the design based on the drawings that were and the renderings that are, are presented to you. So that was completed throughout the year. During that process, there were a significant number of meetings uh, with different folks, including the school site council uh, and the uh, the uh, Newport Beach Police Department, uh, Newport Beach uh, traffic engineer, all to go over the details of the plan to make sure that everything had been considered. Uh, it was then taken to the Division of the State Architect for their approval because that's what's required. Uh, they are the ones who uh, apply the codes to the district. Uh, that was completed earlier this summer. And uh, as is your policy, we also then, upon the completion of that, uh, conducted a community meeting, the one that Ms. Rebard uh, attended, uh, and that was about a week and a half ago. Um, in that whole process, uh, we communicated with a lot of people about um, what security requires uh, and how security and convenience uh, can, in many cases, be mutually exclusive uh, because uh, one of the primary uh, opportunities for folks to uh, have access to our site is through a gate. It is either left open or someone else opens it for someone who doesn't belong. Uh, Mr. Uh, Anderson, in the nature of his practice as our SRO, is very familiar with the practice of uh, students on our campus uh, opening gates for other folks who don't belong uh, on our campus. So we went through all of those issues with all of those folks. Um, as Ms. Rebard mentioned, uh, we did so in a community meeting where we had um, five residents. By the way, we had notified again per your requirement. We notified all of the homes within 500 feet of Ensign's school. Uh, that's about 300 homes that are all neighbors to Ensign's school. And there were some folks there, including Mr. Senecori, uh, to register their uh, opinions about the project. And we listened to those, we talked with them, and uh, as was mentioned, uh, I stated that after a lot of work, including computer simulations of students exiting their classes and exiting the school, of cars and bicycles and pedestrians walking to school, that we were convinced, the experts were convinced that, that the existing plan uh, was well thought out and would be an improvement for the school and for the neighborhood. Uh, on that basis, uh, we put it on tonight's agenda for you to approve to allow us to go out for advertising and bidding uh, so that we can receive 
uh, proposals to build this project as well as the one at CDM. Same process happened with both projects. Uh, doing so would allow us to get started uh, during the school year with a component of the project that can be done while students are present with the objective to try to uh, get the bulk uh, or to get some of the most impactful work done during the summer when students aren't uh, present for it. So that's our current schedule that we're trying to keep to. Uh, Mr. Anderson is here tonight. If you have some, some questions for him, he would be happy to go back over some of the issues we discussed last December. Also, Mr. Shaka is here, as is Ms. Ceresny. They both uh, conducted the meetings, for example, with the student uh, or the site council at Ensign where they raised a number of significant concerns that they had and uh, through the iterative process of discussing it uh, with them, uh, I've been pleased that as we continued through the last few months, uh, Mr. Shaka has felt that uh, all of the folks on the staff understand uh, what the benefits of the program are and how it's being resolved. So if you have any questions, we're all here. Why, why don't we ask Mr. Anderson to come you know, on up? Um, wait, wait. <sighs> Oh, sorry. Okay. I think I've heard enough. <laughs> I mean, oh. I, I appreciate you being here, and, and I will ask you a question, but I want to respond to what, it, am I for, first on my light? I have no idea. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, Thank you. My okay, light I'm sorry. I, I don't mean to be rude. It's just that I think uh, what we're here for is to find the best solution that keeps our kids safe, um, when they're in school. And I, I'm also wondering if, if that um, idea that there's only one entrance, if that takes into account when you have outside people coming in for sports on the complete other side of the campus. I thought that Mr. Woods made some really good points and they were points that I was concerned about, which is, we are sharing our fields. We are letting the outside community use our fields on the weekends and after school. And to have all these people traipse through the entire campus, you, I mean, you, that is not safe. In my opinion, that is not safe. Um, back when you gave us the schematic, I didn't have all that information. I mean, I could have went out and figured it out for myself, but I, I didn't realize that um, everybody was coming in the front, even on the weekends. Because at Adams Elementary, we, it isn't like that. And I feel it's very safe at Adams. We open the gates, because a lot of people in, uh, on the weekends and after school use the fields. And, and I don't know, am I the only one? Am I the only one that's crazy here? Is it good to have all these children unescorted going through the campus on the weekend? No. Now, I'm not blaming, I, I'm certainly not blaming you or anything. I'm, because that's what we, uh, the general theme was we would only have one entrance. But we really have to think about the um, consequences of that and whether that's a good idea. Mrs. Snell, if I could, um, okay. and I just received this copy of this uh, California School Business Officials magazine this uh -huh. last week mm -hmm. for fall 2019, mm -hmm. and there's a Spotlight article called Spotlight on Security. I'd just like to share one little part of it. Mm -hmm. During a recent security audit at a Southern California school district, a retired law enforcement officer walked onto campuses to see how far she could get before someone questioned her presence. Mm -hmm. She was able to get pretty far on a couple of our campuses, this person says. Honestly, it was not really surprising, but still it was an eye-opener for site administration because we have closed campuses. If someone doesn't have a badge, you have the right and responsibility to say, can I help you? You have to make sure everyone's doing that. Creating a single point of entry on campus is one of the priorities that the head of, the, of one of the two primary insurance companies in California that insures school districts states. But that's not easy in California's open style school architecture. That's where a lot of districts are struggling. It takes a lot of changing things around and modifications to be able to get that right. So it, it is, um, if, you, if you would, 
Uh, here are some of the yes, things Mr. I'd be, Anderson I'd be happy says. To. I didn't mean to uh, in, interrupt. In the, in the practice of keeping students safe, of keeping security, uh, the number of entrances and the things that you have to actively manage to make sure that someone isn't leaving the gate open uh, is, is a significant issue for keeping security of our campuses. And on the weekends, uh, the other part of this is, as Mr. Anderson explained back when we talked about it, uh, crime prevention through environmental design, the more entrances you have, the less likely you are aware of who it is that's on your campus doing the vandalism. Whereas if they come through uh, a single entrance, you're more likely to know who's doing it, plus the fact that folks know who's going to be there. Ms. Zaresny's students go to a neighboring district who has recently done this same type of thing at her schools, and she talks with the parents that her daughter plays softball with about these types of issues. I'm sure she would be happy to share with you some of her experiences as but well. But isn't it a balance? Isn't it a balance between um, being as safe as we can be and not creating more problems? Well, it, isn't it, it kind of a balance on weekends? On the weekends. See, I think for the school day, I don't know if there's anybody that doesn't agree with that during school. Yeah, hours. during well, school, it's closed. And you know, if someone really wants, wants to get on the campus, they can climb over the fence. I mean, but perhaps, perhaps Mr. Anderson should respond okay. to that. He is the expert. Okay. I'm are, sorry, I didn't. Are the rest of the board members okay? Because we, we have comments. Make, yeah. I, have, I, have I comments. know we probably should have moved it to the. Uh, okay. okay. I gave people the wrong seat. I know. <laughs> While they're Bless here. You. Good afternoon. <laughs> my name. Uh, I'm sorry. Good evening. <laughs> <laughs> my, my name is Vladimir Anderson, and I'm a retired police officer from the city of Newport mm -hmm. Beach. My last assignment for 12 years was at the Newport Mesa schools, uh, specifically Newport Harbor, Corona del Mar, and Ensign Middle School. Uh, nine of my 12 years were assigned to Ensign in mm -hmm. particular. Mm -hmm. uh, I made it, I was very dedicated, I made it my, my Marine Corps background <laughs> to the safety of the staff and the safety of the kids. I felt very strongly that a parent will drop off their kid on campus and expect to pick up that student the same way they mm -hmm. left it. So my approach uh, at uh, safeguarding the campuses was just that. I wanted to make sure parents felt comfortable leaving the kids on campus. And I, I'm very happy to say that I, I think I accomplished that goal during my tenure with Newport Mesa and Newport Beach PD. I was very uh, happy to, to be asked to participate in this process. I have a lot of historical knowledge, perspective, and a lot of training that goes along. Um, when assigned to the school, I did not have that school policing training. However, it was incumbent upon me to research, get familiar with the, the needs of the community, the school community, and be very, very become an expert in the field of, of school safety. And I did. I became, I eventually became the instructor for the Orange County Department of Education when it comes to creating and writing safe school plans. Mm -hmm. So I do have a background, mm -hmm. and right now I'm looking to uh, do this at the national level. I oh. uh, did talk to Mr. Uh, Holcomb and the team about implementing a SEPTEP principle. It is mm -hmm. a basic fundamental approach to ensuring safety in any community, in any infrastructure, any building that you want to protect. And certainly um, when there's a, a, a building or that has been in existence for a while, certainly you could apply septic principles to enhance the safety mm -hmm. posture. And that's what we did here in Newport Mesa. And I've been struggling in how to frame this. Uh, I've been hearing some of the talk in the community and and quite frankly, I, I, I'm puzzled by the proactiveness of the board mm -hmm. and the, the, and the support that they have uh, to, uh, from other entities in the, in the community. Excuse me. Um, and, I, and I came with a simple analogy. Um, if we look at Disneyland, the happiest place on earth, mm -hmm. you have a main entrance. If we apply some of the requests that are being made, we'll have to open up the back doors to Disneyland to allow people a free flow back and forth from their building, from their, from their uh, environment, and allow them the free flow, and that is not feasible. 
Uh, the reason for the main entry is that you could guide people to the facility, find out who belongs and who doesn't belong, and that's even after hours, and I know that's an unintended uh, consequence, but yes, we want the people to understand where the main entrance of the school is and the layout of the school. If I grew up in Los Angeles, uh, and actually I grew up in New York City and mm. Los Angeles, mm. and the SEPTEP principal is, uh, is present in every st academic structure in, uh, in those cities. If you look at uh, a USC, for example, and we had the discussion uh, when we were coming, uh, when we were looking at different ways of enhancing the, the, uh, the, the look, so mm -hmm. to speak, uh, USC, has taken a proactive approach and implemented some measures to enhance the safety of the students and staff as, as we're doing here in Newport Mesa. Uh, I'll be more than happy to address any questions. Uh, I think we're going on the, we are going on the right direction. We're with the objective that we wanna safeguard our students and provide a climate where they can be productive and successful. And with that, I'll take any questions. I, w I would also like to point out a thought occurred to me uh, uh, just as Mr. Anderson was speaking. When we did that tour, we, we prepared, uh, in essence, a vulnerability assessment, and that vulnerability assessment it maintain is a secure document. It's not available for the public. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a specific code uh, that allows the district to have that and to maintain that. This particular one I, I tell you about doesn't violate any of our vulnerabilities, but to give you the example of when we walked the perimeter of one of the campuses, uh, we got to a gate and the gate was unlocked and there was no lock on the gate. Uh, by the time we got to the front office to find the custodian for the principal who was walking with us to tell the custodian to put a lock on the gate, they said, I just put one on that gate two hours ago at the beginning of the school day. It's already been cut off and it's already gone. Mm. So those are the types of issues of defeating those secondary entrances that we saw as we walked at our campuses. Gates left wide open uh, that should have been locked, but here was a gate that was actually locked that morning by the custodian because the lock had been cut off, the security device had been defeated by someone who wanted on our campus, they were on our campus at night, they put on a new lock that morning, and before we even got to the third period of the day, it was already gone. Mrs. Floor, you're the next fight. Um, you know, I'm, try I'm trying to weigh both the needs of the community and the needs of our students. And you know, there's two things. We need, we need to protect our students, we need to protect our staff. I um, mean, that's, that's our primary folk, that's our, that's our primary mission, mm -hmm. is to educate our students but keep them safe and keep our, and our staff safe. Um, at the same time, we are community schools and we have to look, at, look out for the community. So I have two questions. One is um, this, this contract, this 12, 16A, whatever number. 16A2. 16A2 is letting the contract out, to, allowing us to go to bid on the fencing at Ensign. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. As it's designed, Yes, that's correct. And at, it's been approved it's by? It's been approved by DSA. DSA. Okay. Does it allow for change orders? Yes, it does. Okay. So my question is, is th the next question is, is that I would encourage us, one, to meet with our community groups and meet with, with again, hold a couple, uh, some meetings with our community, advertise it, and please, you know, get your neighbors and let's hear their concerns and then also work with the community to allow to see whether there is there is a compromise, I, 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 whether it be, let's try, it. we'll do it for a year as is and if it's not working and if it's not, if it's not conducive, it doesn't prevent us from adding a potential gate if, if, it's, if it's really is becoming horrific. I just think that well, there must, there's got to be a way to see whether we can broker a compromise that says, okay, we understand the needs of the community, and I'm, I'm with Mrs. Snell in terms of, boy, shoveling kids, you know, if the kids are coming in and they're running late and we, and we have seven-year-olds being not, 
which is typical. I mean, you just say, seven-year-olds run. Run to, you know, <laughs> you're late. Oh, my God, oh, my God, you're late to your practice, and they're not going to park. They're just going to drop their kids off because they know where their kids are going to go. Mm -hmm. That's a little bit of, that's a concern for their safety because they're not being, there's nobody there to monitor. Mm -hmm. So so I think that if we can work with those, the community members, as long as that bid process allows for a potential change order and the DSA allows for some p a potential change order or a reroute. Do, do you know what I mean? We, I follow you. I mean, I if there's... We, we so, did. We talked about that at the community meeting, as Ms. Rebard uh, described, that, um, you know, we've been through this. We have a lot of uh, experts who've gone okay. through this. But if something doesn't work, fixing it is not going to be that difficult if it doesn't okay. work. The, the, the but that I would caution is that... Uh, as we fix something that really needs to be fixed in a minimal way, the more that we go beyond minimal ways, the more that security will Compromise be service. compromised and that other schools right. and other folks will say, what is your standard? If that's not your standard, okay. what is your standard? Right. Exactly. Okay. okay, thank you. Mrs. Black. Um, I, I agree with what's been said. <laughs> also <laughs> talk to you at length and I appreciate your patience but I really did not know I, I you know I walked into it with my own preconceived and biased opinions you know about child flow <laughs> in grass egress but I also live in Newport Heights mm -hmm. and and it's not just the 500 feet it's everyone in Newport Heights we have three schools everyone is going to work every day and then they're coming home from work every day and we're negotiating all these students on these bikes. I mean, I hold my breath on Tustin Avenue um, every single day because, you know, it's not like we're getting less cars parked on the street. I don't think there's parking space on the street anymore, you know, in the main thoroughfares and our students are doing that. So I appreciate the city's help. I appreciate, you know, all the work that you guys have done and, and Vlad's, you know, participation. We, it's really helped us understand it. But I, too, agree with board members that I just want assurance. I know tonight is hiring the, uh, you know, the contractor, going out for bid, I mean, and, and then also coming back on the CEQA process, which we are not, that you were exempt from on this particular project. But we also have an amazing <coughs> rendition of what um, the, the design, the proposed design is now. And I would like to see this blown up as big as you can get it and with a light on it and stuck on the corner <laughs> of Ensign yeah. and, uh, you know, um, Cliff and Irvine. Because I'm telling you, it's the confusion, you know, the hearsay. That what always gets us when everyone is not on the same page and you don't have the information. And I can ask Kinko's, how much will it cost us to put a big board up, you know? And uh, I know this probably against city code because as a real estate agent, we can only use those teeny tiny little signs. But, but the renditions and um, they were talking about from the Homeowners Association, we do have you know, a horseshoe, you know, proposed in this. You know, we have 25 extra, or 25 extra parking spaces. We're gonna have almost 90. That's in one parking lot. There's a whole nother parking no, lot. No, that's why I'm, I'm gonna finish saying that we have three parking lots. We're gonna have almost 100, I mean, parking spaces. So we're gonna be off of their streets and we are gonna be directing families. Um, and the only question I wasn't, you know, really clear on, I couldn't answer is, is the bus yeah. Also, pulling up to the front of the school, unloading at the same time parents are, uh, are they going in the oh, horseshoe? Nice yes, we've talked about that occurring at the front of the school, and we're still working on the final location for where that's going to be. We've okay. been talking with uh, both uh, Newport Beach PD, mm -hmm. their traffic folks, and uh, Mike and his staff that about my, what the best flow that was my next thing. That the city, you, know, you shared this with the city, because yes. they're telling neighbors, they, and I don't know who they are, according <laughs> to neighbors, 
they, some people at the city, said that we are not in contact with them. And I said, no, I was at one of the meetings, so I know, in fact, we, we are. We yeah. have been since last December when you That's authorized right. us to proceed okay. with this. Okay, Thank so um, Dr. Navarro, I just want to ask you, put you on the spot. Can we put this rendition together, blow it up, and stick it on the corner? There, there are a few things we can do, you know, and you know. No, I'm asking you about yes, that. Yes, yes, yes. So <laughs> let, let me let me just go through them all. Okay. P putting that on print and mm -hmm. putting it on a board that's no law, not not higher than six feet, because no, then we have to get a DSA approval. No. Uh, <laughs> we can probably do that. We can put that up and. I don't know if I'd have a light, but you can see it during the day. No, no, I know. But um, there's a the lot other of thing answers. that we can do is 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 uh, we can listen to the community again. You know that we've been through this at other schools, right. yep. and uh, we've stuck to our principles, and we did create, but we did listen the whole time. That just because just because we're looking at this from a different universe mm -hmm. doesn't mean we're out to inconvenience anyone. But we are we are talking about two different planets right. here. Okay, our planet is uh, we're responsible, and if you know, and you know what everything that happened in Parkland in Florida, we're responsible, we're held accountable. Um, my job is to make sure that I don't have to go to one of our parents and say I'm sorry, we shouldn't have put that there, and that's how and that resulted in an injury to your child. I have to live with myself. Okay, my job is to ask my team to create the safest environment for our students during the day. Don't mean to inconvenience the community, but that's the fact of the matter. When you, I mean, everybody knows, when you go to the airport, it's not like it used to be. Okay, safety and inconvenience go hand in hand, unfortunately. Uh, but, you know, if something were to happen, I would want to be able to tell the judge, I did everything I could to make sure no one could get on that campus. And I'm, my recommendation to you is you do the same because if you end up on, on the stand, you'll want to be able to say the same. You know that's that they went after the staff and, and, the, and the electeds in, in Florida because they didn't think they did everything. So my recommendation is we understand we're just in a different universe. That doesn't mean we won't listen. If there's something that our experts think would be a mitigation or a, comp a compromise mm -hmm. after a while, then we'll be happy to do that. But we need to proceed carefully and slowly and judiciously. And, you know, we, our staff, will f are, are going to monitor those permits because it's in Newport Beach. We do not have a JUA agreement with the city of Newport, Newport Beach, Beach like we do in Costa Mesa, and Costa Mesa staffs it. Our team, our employees staff those permits. So they will be there to assist in, in, in uh, the, the, the permittees. So we can work together. I don't mind sitting down and having discussions. I, you know, we'd love to hear from everybody and you know that we want to hear the dissenting perspective because we wanna make sure we're heading in the right direction. That's the most important perspective. And I'm sure that Dr. Shaka will tell you they had a lot of dissenting perspectives. <laughs> uh, but, but you know, yes, there's room for change. There's room to move forward. We can have another meeting. We can talk to people. We can listen. Uh, not opposed to that. I think Mrs. Snell remembers we had plenty of meetings at Adams. <laughs> we had plenty of meetings at Adams. And we and, compromised with the community. Yeah. And, and, and it worked out great. And, uh, and uh, Mrs. Yeltsin remember all the meetings we had at, mm -hmm. at Anderson. Yeah. So uh, we're not opposed to doing that. We can do that. Um, but we're gonna, my recommendation is we listen to the experts. If there's a compromise that our experts approve of, then we can move in that direction. Yeah. And I also want to thank <laughs> Principal Shaka because he, you know, I, I always say, what did I do on my summer vacation? Well, I answered phone calls about Ensign and, uh, and the traffic and parking. Uh, because it is, we really do encroach into our neighbors. So we've been working hard on accommodating, you know, the visitors and making sure that not only our students are safe, but our entire staff is. Anybody that you know, um, you know, is trusting what looking after our kid, we need to make sure that they're safe as well, so. Just putting a staff parking that. lot, increasing the staff parking lot, <laughs> will make a huge difference in those in that neighborhood. Well, I was yeah. a little disappointed when they took down the garages because I was looking at science labs at that because that was uh, pretty exciting when we were talking about CTE, so. Anyway, okay, thanks for your time. Ben? Kena, you've.
Are you? Yes. I am. I can move I on. I said thank you. Yeah. Okay, that's my clue. Mrs. Bartow. Um, well, I just wanted to clarify that this, it seems like we have two different conversations and I want to kind of mm -hmm. distinguish between the two. One's the fence and the access to the community and the other's the traffic flow. Mm -hmm. So just talk about the um, access for the community. We don't have a joint usage agreement with Newport, but our schools are funded by our property taxes and sharing and balancing with the community is really important because they're what makes our school district what it is. Um, is I just feel like there's a way to like put in a fence that's like timed on the weekends. I've seen those places. You could lock them. They could automatically. There's a lot of different ways to approach it, and I feel like starting there versus trying it after a year is maybe a better way to look at it. Um, my concern is with students entering through children entering through the one main area on the weekends, not during school hours. During school hours, I love when it one point of access, but on the weekends, when you've got unsupervised kids coming in and out and after hours, the, the vandalism is going to be a real issue and it's all going to be in the main entry area. And I, I just know how kids are and we're going to have trips and falls and I, um, I, I appreciate, no one appreciates safety at Ensign probably more than me because my kids will be there in a few years, but I, we really do need to balance the, the use of the community as well. And then in regards to the traffic, um, let's have some more community meetings because I feel like I've heard from people in the city too that they don't feel like they were reached out to and I know neighbors who, and I know we did our due diligence in sending those postcards, but as people throw out their mail by accident all the time. Mm -hmm. So it's really, <laughs> you know, it's, it's important that we make sure that everybody is on the same page and even if we don't agree, that everybody knows that oh. they, um, had a chance to review the changes in their neighborhood. They can make whatever decisions they want, but they need to know that they were informed. Thank you. Mrs. Yelsey. Uh, yeah, I just have a qu couple questions and would like um, Mr. Anderson to respond a little bit more to. I agree there's a delicate balance between what we need for the safety of our kids during the school day, which is paramount to us and working with the community. So I do think there needs to be more discussion. And, and there are, I agree with Mrs. Bartow, there are two issues. One is a traffic flow mm -hmm. and one is just a fence because I know at CDM I was at that community meeting and I think people after they understood what we were doing are comfortable with it with the fencing, but there's no traffic, well there's always a traffic flow Absolutely. issue there, but yeah, there's, there's not with, with drop off, so right. they can deal with that. Um, for instance, at CDM, they've already covered up temporarily the open spaces on the field all around where people had open access all the time. Kids would run through five minutes before school started thinking I can get to my classes on time. All of a sudden it's cut off and they're going, whoa, I have to go all the way around to the front. But they're used to it now. There are no complaints. Everybody deals with it. So I do think they are two separate issues and we should have more conversation about the traffic flow at Ensign, um, just with the community. I don't know why the people adjacent to the school were not informed, either they or didn't, didn't re, I don't know why, um, because I think notices are put out. So regardless, I think we should have more community meetings on that. Um, but I would like Mr. Anderson to answer because I had some concerns about this and I, I talked to him um, just as a refresher, like especially with push gates. Initially, I didn't understand either. And first of all, could you explain to the audience SEPTED so they just understand what that is? And secondly, um, discuss a little bit what, how things have changed over the years since we've had, since not only 9-11, but school shootings and, and, and how people have looked at school campuses in terms of being proactive and reactive to situations. And I think it was mentioned possibly of, I agree with having it all enclosed um, during the school day, but on weekends, if we could have a gate open, just talk about what you think would happen if there was a gate that could possibly be open back there. I think that's... Is that one question? Yeah. <laughs> Did you write it down? <laughs> Did you know, take a breath, so who knows? I know, that's a Thank Martha you. question. Thank you, Mr. Yeltsin. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Mr. Yeltsin
Mr. Anderson, could I, could I uh, real quickly just um, point, make a point uh, to, I think, a question that I hear underlying this to, to let you know one of the things we looked at during our, our comprehensive review of the, all of this, and that was the question about whether or not we could put an interior fence on our campuses that would separate the fields from all of the buildings on the campuses mm -hmm. so that in some cases that could be open on the weekends from a completely separate thing. And what we found is that the layout of virtually all of our campuses makes that not work hmm. because well, parking is in, we, we wouldn't be able to meet parking requirements. There were just a whole oh. bunch of reasons why, <laughs> although we all like the idea and in laying out a new campus, yeah, I would be aiming for that type of approach for our existing campuses, that wasn't going to be something that ever, restrooms don't work, you know, there were a whole bunch of reasons Access why to, right. uh, we couldn't find a way to make that option work, which was one that we investigated. So I'm, I'm sorry for interrupting, but I okay. think that was related to your question. Thank you. SEPTEV is a principle uh, that has existed since the 1970s, where you try to decrease the, ex the exposure to crime and violent acts on any facility. Uh, and it's, a, it's by through implementation of certain uh, techniques. And natural sur surveillance, for example, you put an entry point and you could have a, a, a window, or, uh, for example, where you could look at outside and see people approaching. Or you have a fence line where you could see people outside the fence line that can possibly uh, be of a threat to someone in the facility. Then you have control access. Uh, in many of our campuses, we don't have that control. Many people, as you indicated, CDM at one time was very porous. They had a lot of people that had the ability to come to the campus and contact our students or our staff. And certainly through implementation of different uh, postures, we have decreased that. Uh, territorial reinforcement, again, defensing uh, as it exists in many of our communities and many of our homes provides the extra reinforcement that this is our home. This is where we conduct business and you're not allowed to be here, uh, certainly when in operation. Uh, maintenance, uh, many of you I'm sure have heard of the broken window uh, yeah. analogy, which is existed and is prevalent, uh, was prevalent in New York City, where they preached and they made sure that if, it, if there was a broken window, they knew that it wasn't going to invite crime and the likelihood of, of deviant behavior was going to in, exist. So what did they do? They maintained the, the facilities, they maintained the buildings, they maintained the households and, and the infrastructure to be more pleasing and make it feel like people were taking care of it. All of these components are deterrents. They, they send a message to potential perpetrators that this place is taken care of and the people here are very proactive rather than reactive. Um, you know, we talked about uh, in, in our conversation about 9-11 and things have, that have caused a change in the uh, protective posture of our communities. And I want to go a little further back than that. Uh, when I was a young SRO, I belonged to the Slo School Law Enforcement Partnership through the Orange County Department of Education. And a deputy sheriff from Stanislaus County, of all places, had looked at the research of the active shooter phenomenon and created a video. And this video clearly forecasted that there was a dramatic increase in criminal activity and active shooters incidents throughout the United States. And I'm not very pleased to say or reiterate that what he predicted back in those days has come to fruition. And, and it was something that we utilized for training purposes back then uh, to highlight the need to train, to create a, a threat assessment protocols, and to certainly uh, create a more protective posture in our campuses for our students. And, and having said that, I think it's very important that we take away from this conversation that what we're proposing is a proactive approach. We're taking, we're being very direct and saying, no, we're not gonna allow this to happen in our campuses. Uh, some of the uh, discussion that I've heard is uh, what, if, what are we going to do when things happen here at the site? Well, what I'm proposing and what we're, we're uh, pushing forward is a proactive approach. We're not gonna let any individual come on our campuses. We're gonna have 
with the adequate level of fencing. We're going to have the ad adequate uh, level of security as we have done, and and that's the approach of Newport Mesa and certainly of the board. Uh, I understand your concern about after hours, but uh, I didn't want to say this, but my kid was participated for years. I had three mm -hmm. college A students, mm -hmm. and I was in AYSO, mm -hmm. I was in NJB, in mm -hmm. club programs, and you know what? When I went to campuses, they had one entry point. They mm -hmm. had one entry point, and uh, unfortunately, I did not see the graffiti take place that, that um, Ms. Bartos mm -hmm. is talking about, uh, but certainly there was a level of security and a posture that the school had taken, that the district had taken, to ensure that that was the message that the general public got. And again, my goal, I understand the concerns and the, mm -hmm. the issues that the board is having to deal with, and, and I don't mean to dismiss your concern or your, what you're doing, but I approach this with the interest of the families and the students, and I'm not saying you're not, I, and I apologize, I don't mean to, to make it sound like you are yeah. not. Yeah. Uh, but that was, my, in, in my perspective, that's what's my approach, is you know, what can we do to make sure we create an environment for our students to feel safe, and a, a realistic environment? Okay. Uh, and I hope I've answered your question, Ms. Yeltsin. I know you have, a, I, you're there, but I'm gonna, okay, <laughs> thanks. Um, I don't have a question for you, thank you very much, you probably will, but Dr. Shaka and Mr. Holcomb. Um, currently, what we have in place is the old fencing. <laughs> we haven't put any temporary fencing No, up. we have put in temporary fencing yeah. at Ensign. Okay, we have temporary fencing at Ensign. Is it like this? Is it single access right now? It, it's, it's, no, because <laughs> okay. the only place that we put this fence was where there was no fence. Got so it. there were locations okay. where the there was lot. zero fence, we put in a fence, and those fence, the places where we put that fence uh, does not provide that's opening. Okay. That's by the parking, the parking lot. It's by the current the parking lot. Parking that's okay. correct, yes. Okay, thank you, because I. Sure. When we got this whole big plan, I couldn't remember where we were at, and it was my understanding that you have practiced single entry exit. Have you done that yet, or did you? Or is, was I dreaming through a meeting? <laughs> sure. Simulation. A simulated, simulated single point entry. Yes, we've done the computer software and uh, impromptu um, simulated uh, less exit point um, situation. And, with, sorry, with real children or just the computer children? Both. Okay, how did it work? The computer well, children. Real <laughs> children don't necessarily behave. I taught middle school. They don't necessarily behave like computers. Yeah, and just, just, just to clarify, um, one of the points is right now, when all gates are locked, we have single point access to the school. Mm -hmm. So under the assumption that all gates are locked, mm -hmm. that currently exists with the, with the new temporary right. fencing. So um, yes, the short answer is we did a computer simulation and then when the um, uh, bus barn was demoed, we closed the Irvine gate but still had multiple other entries mm -hmm. open at that time. So it was not a single point exit, it was just less, less. students, or, or I'm sorry, less exit points. And they survived? They did. Okay, <laughs> excellent. That was. Uh, thank you, and I wanted to comment, Why wouldn't Mr. Anderson, survive? your Disneyland analogy for me was the first time I got it. If that many people can go in and out of Disneyland, albeit I don't like to wait some days, but at least I get that. Got a lot Mrs. Of exits Oops, there. Mrs. Snell. And then okay. pretty much soon I'm going to call for the question. Um, a gate. A, a gate is like a fence, only it's locked. <laughs> So it appears to me that the gate isn't the issue. Box. It's that you're afraid or some, we're not, uh, we're afraid it's not gonna be locked because there's no difference between a gate and a fence other than the gate opens, correct? Can, yes. I, ha can I hear an amen? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> okay. Ms. Snell, there, uh, Mr. Anderson was sharing with me a pie chart that, that talked about the number of entries and uh, yeah. a s somewhere between 10 to 20 percent of entries to campuses are at open gates. Okay, so the problem is that you don't believe that we would be able to keep the gate locked and, and Ms. Um, Bartow's suggestion of having it electronically lock, it, it, 
I think that's a really good suggestion. Um, I also would like to take issue with the fact that other campuses have more than one entrance. They're all being closed. But they're all, our plan They're is all, all being locked, but there's still gates. But they're being closed, but that's the plan. These, the first CDM, two CDM, they're, cl they're closing all the gates at CDM. They're closing that big gate on the side. They're closing the gate over here. Mm -hmm. I know they closed the fencing, ones. they won't have those gates. So you're not gonna have the gate right off the parking lot. No. no. Okay. Well, I know Estancia has more than one entrance. Estancia has but they hundreds been, of entrances. But they it's haven't been while. gated. They haven't been security gated. That's on our uh, agenda uh, with I, the I theater. I think we're getting confused. I know. T. Winkle but, has more than but, one gate. But Mrs. Snell, and if, what? Mrs. Snell, if you remember, uh -huh. we have the whole plan, and 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 we we uh -huh. identified high priority, and then we're moving no, down I know the list, that. just I like we did with all that. Bob, that's right. So the I, I want to know. I want to know. T. Winkle Park, where they play their games, are you telling me Tinkle those Park all school. those baseball people are going to have to come through the front of T. Winkle High school. school to get all the way to the baseball, the football, fields. Uh, the baseball fields? I don't know how far you want to go into the information that we presented. To no, you the previously. answer is the answer to me is no. That's not going to happen. You're well, going to have some it. gates. I, it sounds to me the answer is yes. No, no way. Yes, <laughs> because it's that's all nuts. But what we're voting on tonight. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, as okay. much fun as this is, I'm sure. Yeah, Mrs. Bartow, you did have a light. Oh no, I just wanted to go I back to the done, automatic okay. locking gate thing. Yeah. Is there a reason we haven't? I mean, you could. No, I've we seen have. Them. We, we we have looked into uh, the options of uh, gates that have um, key card access gates that have magnetic locks and, and those types of things. In fact, uh, we're, we're working toward coming up with some sort of a standard there. One of the big issues that uh, I think Mr. Anderson, Ms. Zaresny, some others can talk about, we've already Please seen folks coming to is um, the, actually Mr. Uh, Bar, Dr. Barmeister uh, probably gave the best example of this is the, I couldn't my group have access just for Saturday only from one o'clock until four o'clock, and we promise that's the only time this gate will ever be used. And now, how many keys to those gates uh, for our campuses are, it, it, it becomes, it, the convenience is everybody's convenience. It's not it's just not the just first like, group's But can't we just take out the human factor and say, these gates are open these hours on weekends, end of story, they lock and unlock yeah. automatically, well, one, and that's it. The but, other issue that uh, was talked about, and, and I think is, is probably part of your further discussion, is the issue of vandalism on our schools. Uh, we have a significant amount. In fact, in the last three weekends, we have had vandalism at a school every single weekend over the weekends where there were uh, people who were there who were supposed to be watching to make sure that our schools weren't vandalized. And you made them. my point. Okay. That's exactly what Brett Woods was talking about. N no, these but are schools that are wide open, that, that no, folks but are walking. It, it'd be the okay. same thing. The um, okay. An AYSO guy is not going to be able, he's supposed to monitor those kids. He can't monitor them if they're halfway across the campus. That's okay. all I'm, I'm going to um, do. Uh, can I just ask a question? Just no. for clarification. You know, you're I'm just the gonna, last question because I, I, it's getting All I'm asking crazy. is, my questions has been answered. A, if we approve this, A, it, we can still have community meetings. Is that correct? We will still have, yes. Dr. Navarro is Okay, to and we can still look and we have the ability to um, look at a change order if it doesn't, if it's not working. We can still work with the city of Newport Beach. We can still work with the community members. We're not, th this vote on this item, on the consent, does not preclude any of those, those, it, it, those addressing any of those concerns that have been expressed by the community, nor by this board. Simple changes would not be a, a big deal. If there are significant wholesale changes, we could even end up with uh, DSA becoming involved again. Because one other thing to remember is that uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act uh, has to be complied with, with various entrances uh, and a number of other issues so that those, we have those, to have approved. By those, those are important details, but you're absolutely right as far, as far as what we're doing here. If there's a change order, we can do that, and we can talk about what the impact and costs would be. 
Okay. Okay. Mrs. Floor has said she does not need to discuss 16B3 anymore. Mrs. Leary, you did a good job of answering that question already. Thank you very Can much. Can I just make another comment about this? And that is, why can't we put the gate in now, and if it doesn't, if it, we see that it's this, left open, we take it out, just no. as um, this Mrs. Barto. This could be discussed at, after we it's hear the We can't input. even agree right now. I'm already seeing tons of pushback that that you don't, you only want at one gate. I, I mean, what? how is I, another I, I, discussion sorry. gonna help? Mrs. Black. No, I, I, as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, there is a gate at Ensign and, I mean, at Irvine and Beacon, correct? That will remain there. There, there is a f emergency access only gate, vehicular emergency only gate. gate you can't Fire. open it. No, somebody has to open it or they wouldn't have the a gate. You cannot a go, okay, explain it. So the fire department would have a key, that's correct. It's a vehicle and emergency access gate. It's not a pedestrian gate. So who else would, um, not to put any pressure on Principal Shaka, but would he have a key? I would absolutely expect Principal Shaka will have <laughs> okay. a key. Okay, so. so since we, and I know you've heard this before, but <laughs> since we entrust him with 1,200 students, <laughs> and um, we could possibly, you know, every day, and we do, and we appreciate his efforts uh -oh. of taking care of staff and students, <laughs> that, and he'll be the keeper of the key. Could we not, um, you know, on a pilot basis, just see how things go and, you know, and... Um, Who's gonna lock the gate at night? At the Mr. Shaka night. is, or well, his I wife's gonna know. drive down and lock it, well, you I'm know, so... No, but that work. is an emergency gate, so my question is, can they cut the lock off of that, or... Well, you know, like I said, we could uh, discuss all of this. No, and, I know, you're and, tired. And, and, and with, the, with the experts and see if we can come up with something. Yeah, because exactly. I, so, I agree. I think, I don't think that um, Mrs. Snell's gonna be able to sleep at night along with, uh, you know, the rest of our board if, you know, this is pending out there, because this is just... Well, the only alternative then is to pull this entire item off. No. No, we I want to go out to bid in that, because so I like approval, all that. Move approval of the consent calendar as presented. Well, I'm, I'm not gonna vote for that. 16A2, so we need to pull it off. Okay, so we have to re... Okay. It has to go to the end. Well, it doesn't have to go to the end. We pretty well discussed it to death. We can, we can vote on that one separately now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So move um, approval of the consent calendar. Uh, less 16A2. Less 16A2. Okay. That was Mrs. I'll second. Mrs. Mrs. Yeltsy will second. Yes. Okay. All in favor of the consent calendar minus 16A2? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, we got through that. Now, I have to ask point of question. If I pulled it, can I vote on it right now or do I have to? Okay, thank you. Item number 16A2. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Mrs. Floor I'll moved. I'll second. Mrs. Black seconded it. Please tell me there's no further discussion. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> well, uh yeah. Oh, no, you got some? I'm going to filibuster here. I, Apparently. I just want everyone to really think carefully about this before you, I mean, obviously, if we're voting yes, I know that you've asked the question, Mark, um, Mrs. Floor, that things can be changed, but it doesn't appear to me anything's going to be changed, changed on this. No. I don't so, um, well, uh, we will we study the situation. We, we'll study well, the issue. Study with, with experts it, that are going to tell us that maybe, that maybe it's not the best thing just to have one entrance, even though it's not practical to have one entrance. That that's all. After I just school. want everybody to think carefully about it. I can okay. I haven't spoken about this. So the, we, Vicki, Mrs. Snell and I were just <laughs> at Ensign on a tour mm -hmm. and most of the kids in Ensign ride their bikes or walk. We saw Dr. Shaka it was literally like two blocks down. It's amazing how much he cares for the kids. For me, a big piece of it is the walkability and the bikeability and safety. So currently, Clay is marked off as a pedestrian or bike zone instead of the one that directly feeds. It's like a runway right. yeah. from the playground down a side street. Yeah, that's beacon. not. Beacon. So I would like to have a lot more city meetings and hear from engineers that work for Newport Beach. Is there a bikeability and walkability like there is in Costa Mesa? For me, these are kids every single day that have safety issues, mm -hmm. not just one time for a possible potential shooter. So for me, that's a big piece of it, so yeah. 
Okay. Thank you for which is a different issue. It's than a different what issue, we're but it, yeah. But it, it's, well, it's, it's connected because this. if the fence was yeah. open there, it would make yeah. a lot of sense. Oh, there you go. Okay. On item 16A2, to send it out to bid. With the understanding that we're going to have community meetings before these people have to build the building. And potential That's my yes. thinking. Right? And a, and a yes. poster with the design on it. Thank right. you. Okay. Not a poster. I want a rendition. On it. <laughs> yes. Laminated. Newport, Newport Art Department. There you go. Okay. Um, a, a point of... Um, Clarity, something. Yeah, personal privilege. <laughs> um, a point yeah. of order. That's what I want to know. Oh, good. Um, can I make an alternate motion? I can't make an, another motion until this one is either defeated, defeated or okay. can I make um, an alternative motion? Well, we've had it moved and seconded. Do we, we have do to friendly. vote on you'd it? You'd have, have to. You'd have, you'd have to ask the oh, person. Oh, can I do a friendly motion? amendment? Oh, I like that. If, <laughs> yes, Mrs. Floor would have to. <laughs> 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 it is and I'm going to say. Okay. Mrs. Floor, can she make she just, motion? I, she, I just didn't she, hear no, you. No, she can make a friend. She can make a friendly. But what is it? She can propose a friendly amendment, and I have the option of accepting it. Okay, my friendly amendment is that we approve this with the change order that the gate, the one gate, be reinstated. Reinstated on, or studied to see if it's safe to have uh, it done? Um, re well, there's a gate there now. That the, the gate there that is there now, it continue to be there and um, perhaps studied in a way that is safe for the gate to be there. If it's to be studied. I, I, you yeah, know, like an that. automatic I, lock. I can't accept that because okay. I know that the gate is already there, mm -hmm. and that gate has a specific purpose that's an emergency. I can't. Not the big um, gate. Not the big gate. The, 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 big, the big gate that we're no, talking, talking about. No, she's talking about the other side. Gate. On Coral and St. Andrews. It's on Coral. Coral. Yeah. yeah. That's the gate I'm talking about. No, I'm yeah, not no. talking about the big gate where people can drive their Again, car. I truly believe that our staff has heard our concerns, has heard the community's concerns, is will, in fact, meet, and, and especially with our, our user groups, because so that's where we're getting a lot of the issues is the user groups. We have, we've, we, we've addressed some of the parking issues. Mm -hmm. We're pulling all of those people out, mm -hmm. 100 spaces. We're talking about, we still have to go to the city with some of the recommendations because we want to cut a, a cut a median off there's you know and there's a couple of drive so we have to go to the city anyway so that's that's sort of still in the works um, so I, I believe that that I trust our staff they've already sent out 300 they'll whatever they do to get more people out there because only four people showed up to this meeting hopefully we'll get some more whatever by other means we'll get all of that posters <laughs> and and we will work and see whether there is an opportunity that's an alternative for user groups because that's what we're really talking about yes. it's not mm -hmm. talk, we're, not we're not talking, talking about, about us we're not talking about our kids and our staff our we're kids talking are about in those user users groups. On, the so, well. on the weekends on the weekends so i i just cannot um i can't i'm sorry I that's can't, all right i can't that's accept right. it so okay that's so, all right in that case call for the question all those in favor of 16A2 as it's written, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Uh, oppose. That no. Nay. Nay. I'm opposed. Nay. 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 I'm opposed. Okay. 4-3. Okay. Pass. Just on closing, we will schedule a time and start Wonderful. looking at it. And okay. I would like you to have uh, faith in our team that we will listen and we will bring you back the best recommendation we can have for you. Great. And I okay. know that. Okay. And somehow we have to figure out a way to contact the community. Well, on top of the way. on top of the letters that went out to the people 500, Dr. Shaka, didn't you communicate? Didn't you send an email to all of your families? Right. So we are trying. We are trying. Okay. Resolution consent calendar. Historically, we do a roll call vote on the entire list. However, I have the capability of doing them separately. I would like the boards thumbs up, thumbs down as far as roll. Oh, I have to, do we have to vote on whether we want it? No, okay, thank you. I have we lots vote? of voting. Oh. Thumbs up if we want to do one vote for both resolutions. Just thumbs oh. up or thumbs down? I think they should always be separate. Okay, then 
We had enough thumbs. A move adoption of resolution 071019, finding the Ensign Intermediate School Security slash fencing project exempt oh. from the California CEQA, CEQA <coughs> Environmental Quality Act and approving the filing and recordation or recordation of a notice of exemption. Mo you move. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Roll call vote. Ms. Matoyer? Yes. Ms. Floor? Yes. Ms. Black? Yes. Ms. Yelsey? Yes. Ms. Anderson? Yes. Ms. Bartow? Yes. Ms. Snow? Yes. Okay. 17B? <laughs> Would someone else like to read the motion? <laughs> Mrs. You Yelsey, guys are all reading? Or? Adopt <laughs> resolution 181019, finding Corona Del Mar Middle School High School Security Fencing Project exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act and approving the filing and recordation of a notice of exemption. Is there a second? Second. Moved by Mrs. Yelsey, seconded by Mrs. Black. Roll call vote. Ms. Matoyer? Yes. Ms. Fleur? Yes. Ms. Black? Yes. Ms. Yelsey? Yes. Ms. Anderson? Yes. Ms. Bartow? Yes. Ms. Snow? Yes. Um, are, you, are these all these people here? For the next one? No, all these people are here for the next thing, okay. and I think that would be okay. for me, but if you, anyone no, wants, no. If anyone needs to go on a quick I'm break, I know that that's, that's we're and just watch so we don't have more than one at a time, please. Yeah. Stand up and go. Or don't drink water. Um, I know, I already did drink water, so I'm in trouble problem. already. Thank you. <laughs> Public hearing. Public hearing disclosing the provisions of the 219-20 tentative collective bargaining agreement with the California School Employees Association Chapter 18, Mr. Trader. So great. So on uh, September 12, 2019, uh, the district in the California School Employees Association chapter number 18 ha came to a tentative agreement and consistent with your board policy 4143, we are having a public hearing to disclose the cost of this agreement. It is inclusive of a salary schedule increase of 3.5% and additional health and welfare cost of $1,148 per participant for the 1920 uh, fiscal year and with that then the uh, total cost um, sorry I lost my total cost. three total cost out out the door sticker price <laughs> three million four hundred forty eight thousand um, dollars sorry three million four hundred forty eight four hundred and twenty six dollars <laughs> okay that was hard I know it's funny a financial guy can okay yeah. I am no, opening the public hearing and I have a comment, 18A, Dr. Dowdy. Huh. Is. So good evening, President Montoya, members of the board, Dr. Navarro, members of the community. I'm Britt Dowdy, I'm president of the Newport Mesa Federation of Teachers. I rise in support of this tentative agreement and I hope that you will pass it and pass it quickly. Uh, we support our sisters and brothers with CSEA and the hard work that they do in this district. And we um, acknowledge that this is a fair offer that has been given to them. My question for the board is how did the board receive the information they need in advance of this meeting to understand the fiscal impact of a $3.4 million agreement? And the reason I ask that is because in past years, Almost every single time after a negotiation sessions, the board would have a closed session um, um, conversation with their chief negotiator to understand proposals that come from either labor group. And I've been monitoring the board agendas as I do each time, and I've not seen an update occurring related to labor negotiations. So my question is, how have you received this information prior to tonight to understand that how this fiscally impacts our district? Thank you. Seeing no other comments, public comments, I close the hearing. And I move to the next thing, which is item 19A, approved the tentative agreement between Newport Mesa Unified School District, the California School Employee Association, Mrs. Olson. Thank you. And as you heard um, Jeff Trader share with you on September 12th, we reached a TA for the successor contract with CSEA. Um, I would like to thank both negotiation teams um, for all their hard work and their um, efforts to reach that agreement. And with CSEA, it was Pam Saunders. 
um, leading her team with Stu Tedford, Sean Katz, Gary Logan, Lynn Aldridge, and Amy Gonzalez as their executive director. And representing the district was Dr. Sarah Jockham, um, Dr. Becky Gogol, Dale Ellis, and Kristen Clark, who was the advisor to both groups. And so over several sessions, um, we did come to an agreement, as I shared at previous board meeting, that it was very, very productive. Not only did we have the working together pamphlet, you heard the highlights financially to the agreement, and there were also some other um, contract language that we worked through over those sessions. So tonight we would ask that the board approve um, the tentative agreement with CSEA. Move approval of the tentative agreement between the Newport Mesa Unified School District and California School Employees Association Chapter 18. Second. Second. Moved by Mrs. Flor, seconded by Mrs. Yelsey. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 7 0. Mm -hmm. Congratulations to you guys. Yes. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Okay, approve the management confidential supervisor compensation benefits, Mrs. Olson. So following that, uh, we have met, the district has met um, with management confidentials and supervisors separately to meet and confer regarding an agreement for the upcoming 1920 school year. And as you can see by, by the agenda item, that agreement was met. So again, tonight we ask that you approve the agreement with the confidential supervisors and, well, I should have started with management confidential supervisors is what it's written. Motion? Move, move approval. Moved by Mrs. Black, second? Second. second. Should we Do we want to wait? For Mrs. Barton? It's kind of well, an important was, yeah. one, yeah. I, make a, I would like to make a comment. Oh. Okay, talk slowly. Um. <laughs> For 19B, um, one of the things that I think is really important is tran transparency and accountability. So for me, for management and confidential, I would like for us to make sure that all contracts are brought to us in a timely manner, not to be evergreened without anyone knowing about it on the board. That has happened now with um, three of our cabinet members. So. I would like for us to, if we're approving compensation and benefits, one of the things as a board, I would like to have more um, of a process in place that we have a calendar 30 days before someone's contract is ready to be renewed. That, to me, is basic accountability. It, it's, <laughs> this is not the same That's a good point, but that isn't this group that we're voting on. I'm but there was making a, a comment. But that, that was a nice, long comment, and I I can continue. <laughs> well, I, I think it's important that on this one, just like we had the public hearing, the disclosure of the amount of money that this okay. is uh, this is going to have uh, this is going to impact on the com management, confidential, and supervisory compensation and benefits, the financial impact of salary and benefits. Is it anticipated, in, anticipated to be $983,663, and this amount it has been budgeted? Right. Yes, it has been budgeted. Okay. It's been moved by Mrs. Black and seconded by Mrs. Yelsey to approve the management confidential and supervisors' compensation and benefits. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, 7-0. Approve, this is the one that you would have commented on it, but that's okay. Approve the executive staff salary reflecting the 3.5 increase for the 2019-20 approved for other management employees and be, I have to, hold on. There's an oral I have to, I have, there's, yes, I have a, a comment which can be made now and then before we vote I have to read. So, Dr. Dowdy. So, hello again. So, um, I applaud these efforts to improve compensation and uh, raise the benefits cap for employees. Um, and if you approve this next motion, I would just like to make you aware that you will have half of the employees of the district with one level of compensation for their health and benefits fund 
and another half of employees that do not have the same have that, yeah. rate. And so our half, who teach students and who nurse students and provide mental support students for service for students, have not been provided the same opportunity and the same rate for the employee health and welfare benefits cap. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so I get to read all of this for you. Pursuant to Government Code Section 54953, Subdivision C3, the Board provides this oral summary of a recommended increase in salary for the following local agency executive re executives reflecting the 3.5 salary increase for the 2019-20 provided to management, confidential supervisors, and CSEA bargaining units. For Dr. Navarro, Dr. Frederick Navarro. Dr. Frederick Navarro is superintendent with no change in his contract term at a salary of $300,062. Nope. Yep. Yep. <laughs> with an increase in the same percentage and at the same time as increases are granted for other management employees and a benefit cap increase from 19,293 to 20,441 with no changes to the employee contribution and with no change to the following benefits, a transportation allowance of 750 per month, a communication allowance of 100 per month. For Russell Lee Sung, Russell Lee Sung as Deputy Superintendent Chief Academic Officer with no change in his contract term, at a salary of $244,665 with an increase in the same percentage and at the same time as increases are granted for other management employees and benefit cap increase from $19,293 to $20,441 with no changes to the employee contribution and with no change to the following benefits, a transportation allowance of $650 per month and a communication allowance of $100 per month. For Sarah Jockham, Sarah Jockham is Assistant Superintendent Student Support Services slash SELPA with no change in her contract term at a salary of $242,489 with an increase in the same percentage and at the same time as increases are granted for other management employees and Benefit cap increase from 19293 to 20441 with no changes to the employee contribution and with no changes to the following benefits, a transportation allowance of $650 per month and a communication allowance of $100 per month. For Leona Olson, Leona Olson as Assistant Superintendent, Chief Human Resources Officer, with no change in her contract term, at a salary of $242,489, with an increase in the same percentage and at the same time as increases are granted for other management employees and a benefit cap increase from $19,293 to $20,441, with no changes to the employee contribution and with no change to the following benefits, a transportation allowance of $650 per month and a communication allowance of $100 per month. For Timothy Holcomb as Assistant Superintendent Chief Operating Officer with no change in his contract term, at a salary of $242,489 with an increase in the same percentage and at the same time as increases are granted for other management employees and a benefit cap increase from $19,293 to $20,441 with no changes to the employee contribution and with no change to the following benefits, a transportation allowance of $650 per month and a community communication allowance of $100 per month. For Kirk Bauermeister, Kirk Bauermeister as Executive Director, with no change in his contract term, at a salary of $226,120, with an increase in the same percentage and at the same time as increases are granted for other management employees, and a benefit cap increase from $19,293 to $20,441, with no change to the employee contribution and with no change to the following benefits, a transportation allowance of $650 per month and a communication allowance of $100 per month. For Kurt Sir, 
Kurt Sir as executive director with no change in his contract term at a salary of $226,120 with an increase in the same percentage and at the same time as increases are granted for other management employees and a benefit cap increase from $19,293 to $20,441 with no changes to the employee contribution and with no change to the following benefits, a transportation allowance of $650 per month and a communication allowance of $100 per month. For Jeffrey Trader, Jeffrey Trader as executive director, with no change in his contract term, at a salary of $226,120, with an increase in the same percentage and at the same time as increases are granted for other management <coughs> employees and a benefit cap increase from $19,293 to $20,441 with no changes to the employee contribution and with no changes to the following benefits. A transportation allowance of $650 per month and a communication allowance of $100 per month. For Annette Franco, Annette Franco as Communications and Public Relations Officer with no change in her contract term at a salary of $157,200 with an increase at the same in the same percentage and at the same time as increases are granted from other management employees and benefit cap increase from $19,293 to $20,441 with no changes to the employee contribution and with no changes to the following benefits, a transportation allowance of $650 per month and a communication allowance of $100 per month. Do I have a motion? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Do we want to wait for Dana? Yes, we do, but that's okay, Mrs. Anderson. Ms. Anderson has her light on. It was it was yes. moved by Mrs. Floor and seconded by Mrs. Yelsey. Before we vote, Ms. Anderson. Um, we have a lot of people who do a lot of great work in this district. For me, it's very upsetting that um, our number one role as a board is to oversee our superintendent. And it was not brought to our attention, it was not brought to my attention when his contract ended, despite multiple requests for that contract. That date passed on June 30th. At the same, so it was evergreen and just continued to roll through. The same thing happened with Russell Lee Sung's. We still, I have never heard a sentence about Russell's contract. He does great work. However, that conversation was never even had as a board. That's unacceptable to me. Thank you. We are voting on item 19C, approving the executive staff thing. It was moved by Mrs. Floor and seconded by Mrs. Yelsey. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Nay. 6-1. Nineteen D, approve the schematic design for the Estancia High School Theater. Mr. Holcomb and Mrs. Oresni, I bet. Thank you, President Matoye. You're welcome. Uh, Mrs. Oresni is making her way to the podium to bring up the uh, presentation with the drawings oh. of the schematic design. We're very excited. Um, back in January, uh, we hired uh, Pfeiffer Architects to uh, to assist us uh, by designing the new theater complex for the Estancia campus. And we went through, as you know from some uh, items we've handled in other meetings, we went through a number of different locations on the site as options for where the theater would be located. Uh, we have uh, done so with a working group of uh, community members and staff from the Estancia High School campus, including the principal, the drama teacher, and the music teacher. And uh, we have presented the schematic designs to them uh, over time uh, as construction costs have continued to grow uh, quickly recently. We had to uh, review it a couple oh of God. times and uh, make sure that we that could deliver good. the project uh, to 
the campus for the amount of money that was budgeted, and uh, we've come to a final design for the project that we will be presenting to you tonight. Uh, and we're very excited about what it will do for the Estancia High School uh, campus. Ms. Zaresny? Would, would you please introduce? Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, Shar is not here, but Dr. Navarro, a board members, executive cabinet. I'm Ada Zarezny, the director of facilities, and um, we're here to present the project as Tim has described. And one of the things that we've told you before about Pfeiffer Architects, who is our, our architect, is when they came in for their interviews and we went through the process of interviewing them, we were looking for the wow factor. And they brought a very small team to the table to meet us, a very effective team, and we're, they've proven to do a really good job, and we're very pleased to work with them. Great, um, really good use of our resources with this team. So this is Sonia Lester. And um, she's been working with us from day one. She's been in the interviews, and we've had the same team. We didn't get one of those dog and pony shows where they brought in a different team once they got the contract. <laughs> so we're really happy to have her on board. Um, I'm going to let her do most of the presentation. I will just go over one slide, and then I'll let her run into the presentation. This is the site plan for Estancia, and what you saw on the consent calendar for Pfeiffer's contract were other areas in scope of work that we've included in the project. And that's really um, so that we have the cohesive design and that we have it done in a timely manner and a cost-effective manner. If we were to continue breaking out these scopes of work for later and later, of course the cost is gonna go up. So this image here is basically showing you the site itself and the blue line is the site security fencing, which obviously is a hot topic for tonight. Um, we do not have a design to show you. We do not have a final. This is just illustrating the scope of work that's within their contract. Uh, the theater itself, you can see, is directly off of Placentia, and it's the red odd triangle shape there. Um, and then we have additional site work area, which is in a tan color outlined in red. And then the last piece of it really was um, something we, that we decided to do because of the detail and the level of architecture that Pfeiffer has demonstrated is to renovate the existing or the old pool that's been infilled. So we had the pool project where we infilled the old 33 meter pool. And the scope of work that we had in that contract was very bare minimum. And so we're left with a filled in pool with really nothing too sharp about the area. And so we're really incorporating it into this design now. And so we can carry through some of the, the design elements of what the front of the school is going to look like and carry it through the campus, which is yeah, why we've assigned good. this work to Pfeiffer. So that's the overall plan. I'll let Sonia um, go ahead and get into some of the details of the project, and I'll stay up here to answer can, any can, questions. Can you answer a quick question? Can you answer a quick question? Before we leave of the course. Map? Just because we're trying, I'm trying to orient. So the gym is adjacent. I mean, where's the is the the gym? Right down. Looks like it's been made small. If the gym is, is right this over the there, gym? that's the, the gym, gym right is there. Right here. Okay. Is that the this same big... size that it is now? Yes. You're not okay. touching. We're basically You're not butting up against it. Oh, okay. Okay, so and so sound. So the front of the the front, well, the sound will be dealt with a hundred percent. Okay. okay. Um, the front of the gymnasium now that pl faces Placentia ends up being the back of the theater. Okay. And so the the front lawn there is the area that gets okay, absorbed, perfect. plus Thank the you. banana road. Thank you. I just like I need Thank to you. I know where the pool is. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm glad I got to uh, hear part of the. Fence discussion. <laughs> so you can be ready for the next fence discussion. Yeah. Um, so I'll just run through the um, overall building plans fairly quickly and then talk about the major building components. Um, so this is our floor plan, and as we mentioned, this is the existing gymnasium. The existing entrance to the facility, uh, to the high school, is farther down. And then this is an entrance into the commons area. Oh, okay. So our building is butting up against the existing sense, yeah. gymnasium, but we are acoustically treating all of the spaces, and we've also looked at how the different spaces are laying out. There are two major components to the building. Um, in red is the 350-seat theater, and in pink to the north is a flexible black box. 
Ooh. Nice. <laughs> These two spaces are surrounded to the east by a shared lobby, and to the south, there is a box office and concessions area. Are you pointing with a laser? I just can't see anything. I can do, try to do both. Can you see that? Oh, I see it now. Thank okay. you. What, what? I was trying to use the cursor, but. Oh, no. Okay. I see it. Okay. Do, is it, ladies, are you okay with the is okay. like cursor? One of these that, it's in like two point font. So a oh. bigger one so we can see where. I'm we gonna, zoom? Not today, but. Oh, yeah, if you have zoom, yeah. You want me to exit out and go, go into a PDF so you can see it? We can do that. Okay. Sorry. You're so good. I Prepared. thought that might happen. <laughs> While she's looking at that, one thing to note is that um, you also saw that there are the different components, the, the site work that's not part of the building as well as the fencing, and those you uh, added through a recent change to Pfeiffer's contract, and it was so that we can, as we look at this new look for the whole campus, we can try to carry that through the whole campus. That's also the $32 million budget you see here is not just for the theater. The $32 million budget is for the fencing project mm -hmm. and the site work and the theater, all of what Pfeiffer is designing for us. Where's the entrance? I can't, where's the entrance? How do you get so in? the main entry is here, which leads you. Um, so oh, with like little planter boxes or something. That's, that's what these little squirrely yes, things are. Yes. So there's are. a plaza area that uh -huh. you would enter, uh -huh. um, that would also be shared along with the entrance at the same level as the main entry to the existing building. So, so there's a gate. On, on the uh, <laughs> fence, is there a gate? There has to be a gate on the fence. Um, that is going to be our next so study. If, if we can just go over the floor, I don't know sure. if this is on, but if we can sure. just go over the floor plan to sure. give you, so you have an idea of what's in the building. Okay. We have a rendering later okay. that, that will tell the picture a little bit more, to tell the story a little bit more. So this Get is just excited. to give you an idea okay. of the new spaces that are part of the <clears throat> theater program. Okay. So I can, I'll go over it generally and then we can zoom in on areas that you have questions on. So the main lobby, which faces Placentia, mm -hmm. is shared by the theater and the um, black box. We have the main entry to the building to the southeast with a box office and concessions area. As we move along the building, there's a center core of restrooms that are shared among the two performance spaces. On the west side of the building, we have shared what we call back of house spaces, and that includes a scene shop, mm. dressing rooms, costume storage, scene storage, and a green room to the north. Ooh. So we have, uh, it's a fairly clear uh, circulation mm. throughout the building. Um, as I move into some sections, we can talk about more of the, the circulation. Um, there is a loading area for the scene shop to the north, um, and that loading area would be able to move scenery through the uh, back of house area into the uh, black box and the um, main theater. So the main 350 seat mm -hmm. theater, which maybe I'll blow up now. It's meant to be multi-purpose. So it will serve functions for dance, theater, and music. Mm -hmm. So we've been working with a theater consultant, acoustician, acoustical okay. consultant, structural engineer, electrical engineer, our whole design team to look at all of the technical requirements for the theater for the <coughs> stage house, for the performers. Um, so that's all kind of what you don't really see in this drawing. But what you can see in the drawing is that we've also take, taken a look at the performer relationship to the audience mm. and how that the audience also may vary um, per performance in multiple sizes. And what we really wanted to do is to be able to create different scenarios uh, for the audience. So the audience is, there's a central seating area, a fixed seating. 
And we've subdivided that into an upper portion and a lower portion. Oh. Mm. So that from the lobby, you enter through a sound and light locks, which helps with acoustics, and you enter the theater through the center. And oh. you can move up or down. Um, flanking the lower portion of the theater, we have these side boxes, which have removable seats. So in a large production, you'll be able to fill the entire uh, auditorium seating. But if you have a smaller production, you could choose to just fill the lower portion and close off the upper portion, dim it down, so that you're creating a more intimate audience cool. experience. Cool. It doesn't feel like you're playing to half an empty exactly. house. Wow. And these side Learning. boxes also have a dual purpose. They're for patron seating, but because the seats are removable, you could think of it as an extension of the stage. Mm -hmm. So the performers and musicians could be a part of the audience during a performance. Mm -hmm. And the stage itself, um, we're designing it. It's just about under 50 feet high, um, which we are calling a modified stage tower but we're designing it so that it would have a rigging system Ooh. to accommodate up to 30 line sets. Wow. So that would be able to have the possibility <coughs> um, at various times for different scenery drops, for different masking and lighting opportunities. The stage will be designed um, so that it's flexible and resilient for dance, but durable for carpentry and stage design. And that same type of stage construction we're going to be using in the black box. In the black, so in the black box, we have a flat floor. We've created an asymmetrical room, which helps with the acoustic abilities and uh, not creating so many reverberations in the room, um, but allowing it to also be as flexible as possible. Um, we have a series of pl movable platforms with removable seating. This is just showing one configuration of seating, but the seats could be arranged in multiple configurations like or, or removed from the room, up to 150 seats. So it's kind of like Samueli. Ish. 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 Yeah, yeah. So you can. Better than. Better than. <laughs> uh, the room is about 40 by 50, so we've taken into consideration a uh, performer area and also area for um, the audience to, to move around. Uh, we will have a pipe grid up at about uh, 18 feet that will be all throughout the room so that you can do various lighting positions. Um, there will be fixed absorption and audio visual systems because we want to be able to make the room available for a single performer or a large ensemble or a, um, instruction, lecture, and also serve as a staging area for the main stage. So if we move to the section. So this section is cut through the main audience chamber and through the black box. This section is taken through the stage house and longitudinally through the audience chamber and the uh, lobby space. So you can see there's a massive amount of volume to these spaces required for the technical catwalks, rigging system, uh, technical galleries, control room, follow spot, um, and but it, we're superimposing it up against these one-story program elements, mm -hmm. and those within the building, but also up against the one-story Estancia High School, um, which is why we've kind of used the massing of the gymnasium, which is the largest mass of the building to try to start then mitigating that large volume and not making the design feel like it was an add-on, but to make it feel that it's really part of the campus fabric. That's great. 
And here I is know. our. <laughs> wow. I guess it was worth the wait, huh? <laughs> Vicky? Oh, Vicky. Wow factor. <laughs> it was sort of worth the wait. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> We're glad we're waxing. So Wonderful. keep in mind the fence is still uh, very it's preliminary. Just a line on paper. Just a right line now. on paper. It's just a line on paper. However, <laughs> line on paper. Um, so to orient you, this is the main uh, administrative area uh, and the main <coughs> student entrance. This is the commons area and this is the uh, gymnasium. So here's the volume of the theater and here's the volume of the black box. Wow. The frontage of the building along uh, Placentia is really meant to open the building up, open the campus up because it's a very interior oriented mm -hmm. building. And so this is the opportunity to try to bridge our design with the existing design to create a kind of a new front door. Wow. So the only other thing I wanted to add was that um, as part of our committee and who's participated in the process of the design, not just with the site staff, we also have Ryan White, which is one of our theater techs, mm -hmm. and has been through us through construction and operating Costa Mesa High School, CDM. And so we've took, taken a lot of his comments and notes on the other projects and incorporated them and reviewed them. So we're going through that process right now. But he's on the, on the committee as well so that we know when we hand this over to him what he's going to like, what he's not going to like, and what he had input on. Mm -hmm. So it's been a very collaborative process. Uh, the team has been really helpful in giving input, and we've had several community or several meetings, and we will continue to have community meetings as you have prescribed in your policy. Um, but this is just the first of it, and really tonight we're we're looking for your approval of what you understand the project to be, so we can continue in our design mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. We did take about two and a half months longer than anticipated, and maybe now it's three, because we pushed this off for a board meeting to have the presentation, oh, awesome. um, so we can incorporate the other scope. Yeah. But we're about three and, a month, ha three and a half months later than we had originally anticipated, but because we went through those exercises, <laughs> additional site locations, and really this was the last one that we had thought of, um, which, which ended up you know, surprising all of us <laughs> that it ended up being our favorite, and really achieves that new front door look. And that was, you know, one of the number one priorities. We knew we could put a theater on this campus somewhere, but to be able to give the school a new front door, a new look, was really a, a major item to achieve. And so we really think we're doing it here with the design that we have presented. Okay. Wow. Wow. Bravo. Um, could I make one, one last comment before you start your questions? You and that's just uh, to let you know that we have, um, there have been a number of issues to work through uh, on the project, and the group has been just amazing. One of the members, I don't remember them all by name, but uh, Laura Ursini Marquin, mm -hmm. who is on our Citizens oh, Oversight yeah. Committee, is a member of the local community, has served. Uh, on the, this working group, uh, it's been a, a great uh, voice for the community. Mm -hmm. uh, and as we've met with them, we, we really had to finalize the, the building and really work on the budget. Uh, we were able to confirm that we can provide all of the scope that you see here within the budget. Uh, and one of the things we went through with the committee as we talked about all of those line sets those are very, very expensive, and at the current time, we can't afford those uh, afford in the budget because the they're about a half a million dollars uh, that we uh, would come out of somewhere else in the budget for the project, or we have to, I mean, that's what our budget was for the project. And we went through it with all of the folks about what the pros and cons of each one of the different things were. The advantage was it's available to have the line sets added when we have the money to add line sets to it. Mm. So we knew that we were getting us as far as we could get us with the money that we had dedicated to the project. So that's one thing to know is we're working really hard. We believe we have an appropriate budget. We're not l taking things out that we don't need to. We made the in two or three different cost estimating firms work, two, three different folks work through the cost estimating because I said it's not for us to just be conservative and cut things and have extra money just in case as we're looking at this, you know, tariffs and everything else, but we needed to really get as much scope as we could possibly get in for our budget. 
So the whole team has worked really, really hard on that. So we believe we'll get all of these things uh, that we have shown here, but just know that it, it's, it's going to continue to be a lot of hard work for everyone. So as we go to things like, you know, what does that brown color end up looking, you know, being, and, and, and some of those as we look at costs, uh, we'll continue to be looking at all of it. The other one is that, as you noticed, we brought the fencing project, the plaza area, and even the idea of tying in the uh, former swimming pool area most recently uh, because we saw such an opportunity to, to tie this all in and make it uh, make a great campus out of Estancia. So not all of that has been through all of our reviews and committee. They've just put something on paper so that you can kind of contextualize it, see it in its location. The building location, the building itself won't change, but exactly how that plaza looks and where the fence goes are all things that we want to go through with the school in detail and talk about what the opportunities are for learning environments and how it will be used in the evenings and all those types of things. So we'll continue to work on all of those little details. And thank you for bringing back some trees, because that was my thought. Because we lost some big trees, we've got mm -hmm. some nice pretty new ones. Um, Ms. Anderson, you were first button. Well, I was going to speak on that secondary, the trees. So is there any way oh. to move the trees to another location on campus or somewhere else? As a former Estancia student. Who loved her trees. I loved, that was my, fa the senior lawn right there was my favorite area. I'm glad to see, because I hadn't seen this yet, that there is outdoor space because mm -hmm. at Estancia being inside cement walls with no windows mm -hmm. all day, mm -hmm. we, people need to go out. So um, my, that, my one question is, can the trees be moved? either to another place on campus or somewhere else. But my the second piece is um, the skate park piece. So for me, all of my friends lived out there in high school. I see kids on the weekend there all the time. The SRO for Estancia is a huge advocate of having a place on campus where the kids can skate that's monitored, that there's somewhere safe for them to be. So I know that there's been some ideas. There's other cities that lease a small, a small portion of the campus to the city and it's a city park. I would like us to figure out, I would like to at least have some kind of information as to if that's a possibility. So. But not for the theater. So I well, can. Well, as, I mean, part of the bottom of page three says additional site improvement related. So while we're Got it. talking yeah. about so, it. Yeah, uh, so I, I can address uh, both of those. The first is with regard to the trees. Um, believe me, I know and I think everybody who was involved in the siting decisions for this uh, project uh, hates the idea of those particular sycamore trees uh, not being on that campus anymore because they're, they're beautiful and, and they make for a really nice area. Unfortunately, at the size that those trees are, I'm not even sure that among the biggest trees that are moved, and I've seen trees with enormous boxes moved, that uh, they even could physically be moved. If they were able to be moved, it would be so costly as to really, it would be, I, I, I can't imagine uh, all of us deciding Perhaps that could that, they that be cost. These trees that hmm? are, I mean, if on the other page, you go to the other so, so the idea, so to there, that question, th that's could they not just those. be moved or have one or two of these uh, that are in the existing, like that one, there's, yeah. a, you know. So, so the, the existing sycamores that are so beautiful there uh, really honestly aren't movable. They're just too big. So one of the things that we've talked about, and this is one of the reasons why I was giving the, the, the preface about that front plaza area was as we were continuing to look and realizing what we were doing with the drop off and the fencing, we started talking about how can we recreate that sense of an intimate space that the students had, that you had when you went to high school there in that what they call the senior quad with the sycamore trees, what can we do to try to recreate that same type of space and have it work as the front entry to the school, a gathering place outside of the theater, 
all those types of things. And that's where we really started to say, we think there are great possibilities and great opportunities here to create that type of space and to have similar types of elements happen in the old pool area that really create a much more rich and, and um, an inviting place for the students of the campus. And that's where we, we really want to talk with the site some more about that and, and how we can come as close as possible. We love trees too. Uh, we would love to see and, and create the, the most pleasant uh, environment we possibly can and trees to all of us are pleasant things. So we believe in trees. Yeah, I mean, even if you could save one of them in this courtyard <laughs> design, like just the don't take that one out rather than one. remove it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and then I would love more uh, And then the skate park question. Yes. Um, with regard to the skate park, um, well, it was, it was never part of the scope. Uh, we, we, as we looked at the plaza, it really started uh, to look at the plaza largely from the perspective of we knew we were going to have to change the flow of traffic. And once we started to change the flow of traffic, it left a space. And the question was, how can we best use that space and not just have it be a bunch of flat concrete? And that's where we started looking at creating, recreating the, the senior quad area. Uh, at the level of cost to create that type of facility, uh, to create any type of skate park is probably five times as much as what we will spend in the area of that. So it would create a significant budget issue for us, even if it were to go in that place, not sure that that would be the place for it. So then the question would be, where else would it go and how would we fund it? Well, what I'm asking is for a more formal, I, I don't necessarily think that that's true. If you put some cement blocks, um, I, would I would like to have a formalized, when we did our tour, it was something that even one of the construction folks thought was like a great idea. And then to also speak with the SRO that it's something he's passionate about. I would like more input. That's something that I think is important. Does the it's rest of the board agree with that? As a, no. I, it's something that I would like more information on. Yeah, I, how do you want to phrase that? Do, do. I mean, if, I, I, I'm a, not opposed to pursuing a skate park idea, but how do we want to say that that's... Just, I mean, just to clarify, like Ms. Sanderson, the, the, the difference between the cost of having... Um, seats, concrete seat walls that, that are, it happens on all of our campuses. Uh, students use things that are not designed yes. as a skate park to and skate on. Right. My that's, question is more so in Huntington Beach, there is a skate park that's attached to the high school that the city has as a park. I would like for us to do a to bit, that. right, so to ha how, what is the process? What are the liability features? What and what are we looking at before we say no? And those, those are the types of features that I was talking about typically are a lot more expensive than the type of features you see here. So maybe when, when you have a city uh, skate park, they're typically, because they typically have bowls. Right, but and if a whole we have those conversations elements. with the city and with Volcom and her, like I want to have those conversations. I don't want it, to, it I, I don't think it needs well, to be a no. I, I, I understand. I'm not disagreeing. Uh, yes, it's separate, but it's also, it's for the schematic plan. So as part of it, that was what well, we had discussed I, I on our personally tour. do not want to see a skate park that will be fenced and now we have to deal with fencing around it because it will be considered for students because and we you don't need a allow gate. students. And we need a gate. Yes, we need a gate. And, right. we, need and a we know gate. how much trouble and that's gonna be. I, 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 this, and we need a gate, yeah. This, this project was under Measure F that for a the theater. theater. And I'm thrilled that we're getting additional, I mean, we're spending outside of the 26 million that we allotted for the theater, we're now up to 32, 32 million. million because we've added these additional and, things. And so say for example, with the fencing project at CDEM, you saw that we took uh, areas that used to be outside of the secure perimeter of the campus and we've created uh, learning areas, places with like a Socratic area that a teacher can take their students out uh, within the secure perimeter of the campus and have a nice area that's landscaped that they can they can conduct small lectures and Socratic uh, debates. And so that's the same type of thing we were looking at with regard to this as we brought the fence in is here's a similar type of thing that we have at CDM trying to meld the two together. Well, and I guess that's the issue. The issue is that this is an educational setting and skate park is uh, skating is more of a recreational. I'm not opposed to looking at our sites and, and working with the city because that's a city 
project that yes, would I not Part of it. why social emotional health and learning is very important to us, not just academics and I'm behavior. I'm not saying People that, need but to that's have a not well don't argue. Experience. Just, so it's anyway, to argue. so okay. So are you done? How do, well, no. So I mean, do we? Can we include that? as an option, I mean, part of it is like, no, I, I don't know how- This, what, this funding this can't be used for a skate park. You're under the bonding requirements of the bond that this was passed, and there was no authority I'm in the bond. I'm talking specifically about I understand. the design, not the- I understand, but you can't, you can't design it and use the bond money that we're using. Okay. Or a skate park. But that doesn't mean we'll we can't pursue working with the city yes. to find another location close to, onto, next to, whatever, and but and we can do that. Great. Okay. Mrs. Floor, you were the next slide. I, I, I just have two questions. Oh, yeah. One is because, really? I'm, okay. <laughs> one is because I'm getting up there in, in senior citizen age, and, and, and I, have a, I have a handicapped 94-year-old mother who we go to the theater. And if we go to Samueli, for example, it's horrible to drop her off if they're a wheelchair or if they're on a walker. And I just want to know where the handicap access is or the drop off so that we don't have our senior citizens, i.e. me, walking <laughs> 15,000 feet steps to get to the entrance here. So I just want to know where is the planned Handicap so, parking since every it doesn't look like there's anything going to be there. Yeah, so the the drop-off at the main office right next to the main office where you see um, So you see the the red area then next to that you see the circles with the trees in it mm -hmm. and then you see that um, The area that comes in there that area will end up. It's right at the main office That's where the main gate is contemplated to be that's where the handicap parking oh, okay. for the site so, okay, is right contemplated. Over here. Yeah, so it's still, okay. still going to be a little bit of a, uh, a jaunt. It should be an easy wheelchair okay. 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 Your walker should work without any I problems. Hope so. I hope so. Okay. <laughs> the second, the second item has to do with some technical things within the theater itself. We. This is just a request. Two things. One is that we have acoustical because we've noticed that the right. choirs needed acoustical and we don't have shells. acoustical screening and she shells. said that she said that and the second one is given this community and it's it's um, it's multilingualism that there's a bill uh, there's an ability that oh, you can that. literally Wireless. hand out hand out translations. translations and you can plug it into the seats and and there's they can be sitting there um, oh, with translation the ability to have have translation Everything and I'm just devices. knowing whether there's a so that's just a program goal item as far as translation. Okay. That's all. Look at Thank you. Yay! So that, is, thank you. By the way, um, the equipment, the equipping of the theater with things like that and theater lighting and sound boards and those types of things was another part of the significant discussion. It is in our budget. So say, for example, the ADA comply, uh, capabilities of having assisted listening devices is in the budget. The sound board for the theater is in the budget. So uh, there, Great. it's a, all it's of well the things necessary out. for it to be uh, a proper theater are included in the budget. But that was, it, it's, how, how much is it? It's well over a half a million dollars in just equipment, the equipment. for the theater. Contact me because I know the owners of uh, Mole Richardson, which is a major lighting company in, uh, in Hollywood. Excuse me. My kid works for a lighting company. We're not going there. Um, this is Yossi. Um, yeah, there, there's a reason, obviously, we hire great architects to do this. I know this summer when we went on a tour of the improvements of the campus, and you mentioned where the theater was going to go, and we looked at, like, is there enough room there mm -hmm. in that little yeah. triangle, and no. what about the trees and all that? Um, but it will make such a yes. statement entrance to the school and just change the whole face of the school. I think it's a terrific design. So I compliment you on finding that little space. It's uh, it was pretty amazing. And then also there's there's an advantage to being last yes. of the four <laughs> our four components of high school yes. Yes. Of, of learning we of learning other from the others. So Absolutely. I know Ryan's been involved, but have you all talked to all the other sites? just to see 
what did work? what what we would have done differently just to get some idea that might be a good idea yeah no we can definitely do that we had talked about even bringing um, some theater specialists from other districts to come in and kind of have some insight as well we haven't gotten that far yet but we can definitely do that I do remember one specific question that this isn't as many seats and we have a break in between but I remember one of you saying not the super super long aisles <laughs> and so they're, they're 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 shapes so they're not as long and so we did we didn't forget about some of your comments on the other projects that we built as well so we'll definitely continue to do that and that Absolutely. as well as I assume all the user groups at the school have been involved in hearing what's going on like the the staff so oh, yeah. your the music staff, like teacher your music drama and teacher the drama and then and there's it. outside representatives that one of them is a volunteer who actually volunteers with a theater production he's part of the team and then okay so um, they've all been yes. included in yes okay and, great oops look at the lights going back on mrs snell i was going to have you be the last word would you like to be no okay fine be <laughs> Before you, you'll be the You next. never know when the last word's going to come No, around. but I'm having a middle word, which is, oh. I absolutely see that you heard things that we've said in passing, in touring, in just in comments. I feel that you heard, and yeah, I totally agree, last, the last air conditioning people are real happy to be last, too, so that worked well. Mrs. Snell. Yes, I, I, I really like the design. I just want to cl clarify again, because we voted on another schematic tonight. So uh, the schematic is just the scope and um, <laughs> this initial design, which could change or just the detail. Uh, yeah. Material. So what we're really asking you to, um, to approve tonight is everything you saw inside the building the location of the building, the general appearance of the building. The only thing that we're really not asking you to commit to is that exact courtyard design, mm -hmm. the Fence. exact landscaping, the fencing, of course, the exact covered walkway. It may look like that. It may look a little different. It's really everything within the building walls and then getting us to the building and accessibility and then really understanding what's in the building. A 350 seat theater, a black box, all the support sp spaces. There aren't 17, you know, restrooms. There aren't yeah. Yeah. duplicate dressing rooms. There's, you know, one set for each, um, for each group and the black box itself. So if you if you would have looked at that and you said, well, that lobby looks really, really small, mm -hmm. you know, have you considered a bigger lobby? You know, just by looking at it and now that you've been through and you've seen some of our other, you know, you've been to all of our other theaters, you guys have a really good idea of what you've seen in other locations mm -hmm. and whether or not this sounds like it's equitable, which was our very first task, right? First task was, what equitable. are we doing here? Mm -hmm. How did it work at the other sites? We took mm -hmm. the square footages from both CDM mm -hmm. and Costa Mesa and compared them to the overall programming that we mm -hmm. had. And then we applied it here. And based off of certain recommendations that we had from the architect, we, we were able to create some more flexibility. Like the black box is a little bit better because Ryan said, there isn't any good circulation at our other ones. We need mm -hmm. to make these adjustments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So program so wise, we're across the board equitable, just a matter of what is new construction. So everything you see here is new construction. At our other schools, other elements were new construction because we demolished the 400 building at CDM. Mm -hmm. So we, we demolished the music classrooms mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. shops. And mm -hmm. so we had to build that new construction, which was part of the program there because we had displaced it. Now, so we're not displacing Right. Um, program here. We are simply bu building the new elements in new construction to meet the overall 350-seat uh, theater program requirements. Okay, and this schematic has been approved by your committee, which ha which has our drama teacher, the principal, and all that community stuff. members. Correct. Um, because I, fr uh, frankly, um, I can't just tell from looking at this that I, I like. I like the, you know, the rendering, and if you had a rendering of the inside, I may say, yeah, that looks good, but I can't uh, tell. Um, 
So we're going to bring I'm it back to going, you. Okay. And oh. we're, we're going to bring it back to you. We'll eventually, but we're going to have color boards and picking all the, you know, okay. pretty elements okay. of it so as well. So it's just the elements we're approving. Things could kind of move around a little bit. That's what I'm trying to yeah, figure out. I, I, mean, I don't want to get stuck, it, it you know. It in won't change. Should, no it won't gate. change significantly. <laughs> Mostly materials. This, it, it's really it won't change significantly. The okay. the layout is pretty much set. There may be some tweaking here or there. Okay. You know the elevations. All of these things. The architect goes through a lot to I get know. to this stage. Can and we it needs get a rendering get of what the inside would look like? What the what it would look like? Yeah. So our next steps are would be that. Come up, come up to the mic for us, thanks. We can hear you, but the world has to hear you. So in our next Solar steps energy. is when we start applying materials, we start refining the interior okay. design. We go to the lengths of picking out the materials for the seat, making sure that the acoustician appreciates sorry, The reclining that. seats with the little cup holder. Making no, sure okay. that there's not a much noise when the seat flips up. So <laughs> no. that's going to be our next steps. Okay. And so for the next time when we, we, we meet again, then uh -huh. we would have some interior. Uh, but this rendering, the way it is, has been approved by the committee. Yes. Yes. And they like it. Yes. OK. Uh, thank you. Um, and what's happening to the old, um, are they just the old theater? Is that just the a rehearsal hall or? So it's just going to end up know? being used yeah. as a lecture hall, oh, okay. which is similar to what, so because it's what interior, interior to the yeah. building, right? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. at Costa Mesa, we demolished the Lyceum and they didn't yep. get anything back, okay. right? Yeah. So because this is interior to the main building, there wasn't much we could do other than repurpose it for the, sure. the school site can use it as a lecture hall, which and was the same. Uh, all my community meetings are in the lecture hall at CDM. So okay. it's a, so that's the same program that we had there. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Very, very nice. Very nice. Mrs. Black. Um, yes, a couple things. One is there's a question about um, how is this going to be energy equipped? Are we going to be utilizing the solar and I believe that the solar is already spoken for with our, <laughs> our campus. You know, so we're right? not in, we, we we're put not adding more. we're not adding more to it. We're not adding any. There isn't a solar component component to the project. Um, just to, do, do you want to speak to just Title Twenty Four design? I, I would guess just because as things get newer and newer. They're you, more and more energy. We're, we're required to design at such a high level now that you can go a couple extra lengths to put, possibly put solar on the building if you chose to. Um, but the benefit, the cost ratio nowadays for what we are willing to put on roofs yeah. is, right. you know, that ends up being a challenge for us as a district just policy-wise, right? right? So roofs. then no it would be a matter of do we want to add another structure to a parking lot? Well, no. then you have the cost to offset that. And, right. and really, we, uh, one, right. access to uh, solar on the roof is a problem, and then the damage of the roof mm -hmm. long term. So th that was a decision that we had made of why we did parking lot and shade structures was to, to not create that element of maintenance for us. So I guess my question is, so the current solar is, is not at the capacity to take on this new construction? No. It actually, uh, in order to tie it all in together mm -hmm. safely, is really expensive okay. uh, to have them in different locations across the campus. You have to get all of the wiring to go to a certain place so mm -hmm. that it has all the safety uh, backstops, et cetera. It's it really, it's it's difficult to do in multiple locations on an existing campus right, right. Uh, and expensive. Well, I just, you know, Martha but, put a bug in my ear and I, and, you know, because we were both <laughs> waiting so long and so happy <laughs> with our solar you know, that we've done, you know, we benefited greatly by waiting, being the last ones on the block in but Orange County the other, to get The other it. thing that was mentioned that, that is important for the public who's listening to, to know is that the current state of California's building code requires very efficient buildings right. just as a baseline now. Oh, and this building great. will be uh, many times more efficient than our existing buildings. And then I would like to schedule for the multiple meetings you're going to have with the new <laughs> rendition of the proposed 
budget. Yes. I'd like to know when those meetings are. I'd like to be invited as a board member. And I want to see the six foot eight, you know, foot <laughs> um, picture. picture of it in the front of the building. And I guarantee you it's going to be a new way because we are working on all of our sites and doing master plans. And I think it behooves us. People really don't want to read emails. They don't keep the postcards 500 feet away from the site. They want to see it in real life and they're not going to go online and do it. And, and I'm not, you know, I just think I'm over it. I'm totally over it. Blow it up, stick it on the corner so everybody can walk by and see it. I think that's the, the best way to do it. Staff can go see it. Kids can share with each other. And there's some pride of ownership on it because it's, it is an, a great design. So I appreciate yeah. that. We typically do that when we're in construction, not before because of the aspects of it that can change right, right. Mm -hmm. so that's right. why we're really careful what we show you because we know it resonates right and so we have to be really careful with that so we don't necessarily always put it up um okay. until it's ready but we can talk about when that okay well mrs happen. snail and i will be putting it in front of the gate that will be out in there we'll go to tinkos ourselves and blow it up so the last thing i just wanted to mention and to remind you i'm not sure if you said it in their opening statement but that we're also presenting to the citizens oversight committee for measure f so so they're in the midst of all of these meetings we're having quarterly meetings with the coc as well and so mm -hmm. they're up to speed they haven't seen the rendering yet because we wanted you to see it first mm -hmm. um, but they're up to speed with what the scope is um, and understand oh and Laura Ursini is on both committees so yeah <laughs> so it's a good thing yeah. <laughs> well thanks for that that's great seeing no good more job. lights do we have a motion to approve the schematic design go ahead so moved second thank you Gosh. moved by mrs. Snell seconded by mrs. floor any further discussion all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank Congratulations. You. Boy, we Good job. Spend money and we know how to do that. Ready? Are you ready, Dana? For what? Community input. Oh. Community input on non-agenda items. Oh, okay. Yeah, I haven't. I lost my little cheat sheet. Okay. I let's see. A, mine's old. Okay, this is an opportunity for the public to address non-agenda topics within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board. Per board policy 9323, each individual speaker will have three minutes. Speakers may not cede unused minutes to other speakers, and there is a maximum of 20 minutes of comments per topic. When board consent, the president may increase or decrease the time allowed for public comments, depending on the topic and the number of persons wishing to speak. In compliance with board policy and the Ralph M. Brown Act, the board is not permitted to take action on non-agenda items. When addressing the board, it is very helpful if you state your name and address for the video record. We have several people wishing to speak, and at this point, I do not have any intention of shortening the amount of time per person, nor do I have any intention of eliminating anybody from talking. So just so that, because she said I, we aren't going to. First person, Stu Tedford. You won. Yeah. <laughs> President Matoya, Dr. Navarro, board and uh, cabinet. Uh, Vice President of CSEA, Stu Tedford, here to thank you very much for the honest and uh, diligent negotiations on our contract. We really appreciate the input from all parties and the leadership that Leona showed uh, really set the tone for what I thought was a very amicable and uh, pleasurable experience, actually. Um, we do a lot of hard work at CSEA. Our classified folks really do uh, shoulder a lot of burden in our district, and we really understand that the kids are first, and that's why we're here, and we, we realize that. Uh, we also realize that negotiations are ongoing with uh, other uh, units in our district, and uh, we want to let them know that we are here to support them. Um, and that we hope that their negotiations are as fruitful as ours were. Um, I think it's a, a, a fair ask um, what we decided on, and the fact that you've approved it shows that. So I'd like to say thank you again, and uh, thank you, Leona, for your leadership, Sarah, and the rest of your team. And I'd like to thank my team, uh, Pam Saunders and uh, Gary Logan, Sean Katz, 
and mm -hmm. Lynn Aldrich, and of course Amy Gonzalez is always leading the charge for us. <laughs> uh, wonderful labor rep, and um, I'd like to recognize the Sea of Blue and hope that they're as fruitful as we are in their negotiations, and thank you again. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Tara Boyd, and on deck, Dr. Doughty. Good evening, President Matoye, Superintendent Navarro, board, members of the cabinet. My name's Kara Boyd. I am a teacher in our district, teach at Mariners Elementary School. Um, I'm also the parent of two children, one at Harbor and one at Newport Heights. <clears throat> and um, I've got a few things to talk to you about tonight, um, but I'm going to start with the idea that I've been working through Math Fellows program and CGI training, one of the best trainings I've ever had in mm -hmm. 20 years. I highly recommend. Um, but we're reading a book right now called Talk Moves. And Talk Moves is all about facilitating student learning and getting students to really learn from one another. Um, part of the whole idea is creating a community where everyone can work, everyone has an, an idea to contribute, and we can learn from one another. One of my favorite talk moves that I've learned about is asking children, once they've come up with a strategy to solve a problem that maybe wasn't as effective as another one was, is asking them if they'd like to take an opportunity to revise their thinking. It sets them up with an opportunity to think about what they've done, why maybe that solution didn't work, learn from a colleague, learn from a peer, and come up with a better strategy. So tonight, with that in mind, I would like to invite all of you to take an opportunity to revise your thinking. Talk to one another some more talk to the community some more, and think about some of the things that are the sea of blue is here to talk to you tonight. Um, first of all, public comments. Moving public comments to the end of our meetings, I think we're better than that. I think it's our, it's our role. It's our role as public servants to be inclusive to the community. And we want to do that by being respectful of people's time. Second, the calendar. You had several meetings about the calendar. At the beginning of those meetings, we were told that there is no data to support a change in calendar. Over and over, we were told there is no data to support a change in the calendar. It's unprecedented in this district to make a change that big that is not data-driven. Um, I think there's an idea that getting AC would change that. I don't think AC changes the problem. It doesn't solve the problem. Students are still outside for PE, for recess, all of those things. So I'd like you to take an opportunity to revise your thinking about the calendar. Um, and then last, I am a member of um, our community that does not take benefits. I receive benefits through my husband. I see my time's out, about up. But I'd just like for you to revise your thinking and follow the contract and contribute that money to benefits. Thank, Thank you. you. Dr. Dr. Dowdy, then Kirby Piazza. I'm just letting you know who's up next. So good evening again. Uh, first, I would like to thank the 141 people that signed in tonight. We may have had several others that we missed. This was a large outpouring of members who care deeply about the issues you're going to hear about tonight. The majority of these members came straight from parent conferences to this board meeting. Uh, and so they still have a lot of work ahead of them tomorrow. Elementary conference week is a significant amount of work for all of our employees. Our union is negotiating in good faith. And we want to make sure that that is known. And we want to reach a deal, and we want to prevent any future harm to labor relationships. But we're very concerned, and we're not sure if the board has all of the facts. Part of that concern is because we don't know if you've had agenda time to discuss these important issues. For example, tonight you discussed facilities improvements, which are significant, for over an hour and a half. 
However, the issues that we're talking about impact the lives of 1,200 employees forever. Not to mention how they impact students and parents and everyone else in the community. So we're hopeful that the board will dedicate and allocate the appropriate amount of time to consider the weighty issues that are before you. Some things that concern us deeply involve our benefits plan. About a year and a half ago, we discovered that the district was not upholding their end of the contract and how they contributed money to pay for the benefits program. So we followed our protocol, we filed a grievance, we filed a, a basic, an unfair labor practice, which is our version of a lawsuit, and we're set to go to a legal hearing next month in mid-November. However, the last best and final offer prevented by the district to us would require for that exact language to be removed from the contract. That would cause permanent change in how the program is, is paid for. That language has been in place for over 20 years. We're very concerned that our ask for our employees to have the same health and welfare benefits contribution cap as everyone else that was approved tonight was not offered. These are unfair offers. They're not what you would consider something that is a, a give and take in the exchange of ideas. It appears that the district is rushing towards impasse, which is a, a, a tough, tough legal issue with specific legal criteria that can permanently change the way that labor and management work on issues. We're deeply concerned by this. We're doing everything we can to bring ideas and change, and we want to continue to move forward. We believe there's a lot of room to wiggle at the table. Matt Armstrong will be after you. Hello, I'm Kirby Piazza, and I'm a teacher and a parent and a grandparent <laughs> for a future student here, and I have two daughters who graduated from uh, Newport Mesa. And um, so uh, I'm also a collaborator with many of you. That's what I feel like uh, throughout the years. I've really had a great collaboration. When we come to the district with issues, things like that, it's always a collaborative feel. So thank you very much for that. I really appreciate that. And having said that, something Dr. Navarro said earlier was great, like what planet are we on? I feel like we are on the same planet. You know, all of us are on the same planet. The difference is, as far as we're talking about, say, the calendar change, we're going to be on this planet longer than a lot of you. We're going to be on this planet for a long time, 30 years or more with teaching, parenthood, stuff like that. So we really care about this planet that we're on. And I think that one problem that has come up is the consensus has not been met. Um, at Coast Mesa High School, we had to get a consensus to go to the block schedule. It took over three years. We had no votes. But we went back and we convinced people and we got that consensus. So when it was changed, it was, it was a smooth transition. We don't have that right now, so I think we, and I say we because it is all of us here, I think we need to go back and look at that again and get that consensus. Um, as far as the money is concerned in our contract, the 3.5%, it's nice. It's not an issue with most of us. I'm a little disappointed in the message that's going out to the public that keeps highlighting that the money is great. We're one of the highest paid districts in the county, and that's great, but it's not really a thing we're complaining about, um, but it seems like it's being pushed to the community that it's an issue. Um, does anybody here believe that we're paid too much? <laughs> okay, so let the record show that nobody voted that we're paying to, getting paid too much, so I don't think 3.5% will change much. And last but not least, 13.2. Who knew I'd know some article in the contract, but I've memorized this 13.2. It's a contract obligation by the district that was signed by the district, signed by the union, that the contributions to our health care would be met in certain ways, and it's not, hasn't been, been met. Um, does anybody, would anybody vote here to lose a contractual health benefit? Let the record show that nobody would sign that or vote for that. So I would suggest that we all go back and look at this and see what the issues are, um, because they're, they're very important, and I know we, I, I want to work together with everybody. I will be working together with all of you in the future. 
doing great things. And um, so I think this, these problems can be met and uh, we just need to go back and get some consensus and change some things and look at that to uh, help us all out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Matt, and then Tina Taylor. Uh, Tina Taylor after Matt, I didn't know if you heard me. Thank you. President Matoya, uh, members of the board, Dr. Navarro, um, and all others, thank you so much for your service. Um, I'm Matt Armstrong, teacher at Newport Harbor, and I'll say NMUSD is a great district. <coughs> uh, I feel lucky to work here. I could go on for more than three minutes about the amazing things that happen here that happen at Newport Harbor. Um, I've had a successful partnerships and experiences with a number of administra administrators that are sitting here, um, but my professional concern does regard the uh, August start calendar that has really become the centerpiece of the district's negotiating position. For me, any initiative that requires such a comprehensive long-term propaganda campaign needs to be considered suspect. As a professional educator, I've dedicated my, life, my life's work to youth development. I'll lead the kids in my classroom whenever they're there, whatever month it is. But in this case, I truly believe that the community will is not to start early. And I think there's data to show that. And I also feel it's my duty to uphold the community will, provided that it is legal and ethical, which in this case it is. And I don't think I'm alone in thinking this way, and this is why I think that it's my best explanation for why your faculty is so strong and unified against this calendar change. Thank you. While Tina's awaking her way, Charlotte Zaremba, you're next. Good evening, President Matoya, members of the board, Dr. Navarro, members of the public. My name is Tina Taylor. I'm here as a parent of three daughters, a single parent with no father in the picture, and also a teacher at Costa Mesa High School. Um, my daughters are um, AP takers, honors takers, and at the top of their class on multiple campuses. My kids are also starting to go into college. And so we started with my first, uh, a family tradition that we all go to tuck my daughters into college. <laughs> and I'm here to talk about the calendar change because that calendar change negatively affects my family and, and as a teacher. Uh, if that happens, then I am torn because my family cannot go without missing school significant numbers of days uh, to be able to tuck each sister into college. And so that is a really hardship. So that means that I'm going to go, but they have to stay behind and they're gonna have to live with friends for those days and they're going to miss that experience. The other side of that as a teacher, I'm taking my children to college for their first years, but that also means, because my family comes first, that my students are gonna be with a substitute to start. So that calendar change hits in a multiple ways that I don't think has really been thoroughly thought through. And as AP takers, all of my daughters have said, they don't need extra time. They're all scoring in the high threes and fours as it is. And so going back to that data, why? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Charlotte Jeff Freitas, I hope I said it right, or Freitas. Good Freitas. Um, good evening. I'm a teacher at Estancia High School and I'm representing an MST. I'm sure you've heard about benefits article 13.2. That's a part of our contract that states that health benefits funding of employees, all employees who decline any health benefits, be deposited in a health benefits fund, and that these funds will be used to offset future increases in health benefit costs. And in spring of 2018, it was determined that this fund has not been maintained by our district. An unfair labor practice was filed with the Public Employees Relations Board. This is the subject of a legal hearing scheduled for uh, next month. So accepting the district's last, best, and final offer requires that our union agree to remove benefits Article 13.2 from our contract. 
How can our union agree to remove Article 13.2 from our contract when this article is the subject of a legal hearing scheduled for next month? Uh, article 13.2 benefits every employee in our district. Our union cannot, in good conscience, agree to a contract that requires that Article 13.2 be dropped at this time. Thank you. After Jeff, it'll be Angela Perales. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jeff Freitas. I'm the president. Freitas. Sorry. That's right. I'm the president of the California Federation of Teachers, a vice president of the American Federation of Teachers, and a vice president of the California Labor Fed. We bring 85,000 members here from the CFT, 1.5 million members here from the AFT, and over 1 million members from the California Labor Fed to stand here with our brothers and sisters that are helping and serving your students in this community. The work that these members have done in this state have only helped this school district. When they put on the ballot and they fought to pass Prop 30 and Prop 55, while you are a basic aid district that did create money for this year to relieve the pension costs that your district is doing. Their work is helping your schools. Their work to, to help pass 1505, which was just signed by the governor, and to help get AB 48 on the ballot so you can get facility bonds from the state that build a theater type situation is work that these members did to make sure that your school district can continue to thrive. Not only are they doing that at the state level, but at the school site level, they are making sure that it is safe and supportive for every student, that they are educating every student in your community, that they are providing for everything in your community. And when there is a stranger on campus, it is their responsibility to make sure they are asking if they are supposed to be on campus and putting their life in hand. So we're asking you to do the right thing because their working conditions are the students' learning conditions. And when I was in the classroom, I was sick all the time because there are so many germs with those students, and we all know that. <laughs> and that's why their health care is so important. And their rights and their contract are so important. And their wages are so important. And to harm them financially to make a point about 13.2, which has helped the entire school district, or about the calendar is not the right thing. So we care for the community's children. All I ask, are you gonna care for us? Thank you. Hold on, hold on a sec, Angela. Angela, one sec. John Brazelton, you're up after. That was it, now you're ready. All right. Thank you. Um, I wanna start with saying that I'm a student at Costa Mesa High School, and I wanna ask you guys, you guys care about our happiness. You guys care about our safety. But how could you say that when our teachers are being treated so poorly, when our teachers are being paid not to their you know, needs? They do need to be taken care of. Their health is very important because if they're not around, we can't be educated the way we need to be. So I ask you, please, accept our teachers' needs, because their happiness is ours. Thank you. Thank you. After you, John, will be Nicholas Dix. Okay. Uh, good evening. I'm John Brazelton. I'm a 25-year uh, teacher at Newport Harbor and also a parent and a resident. Um, within our district. Um, as many of my NMFT brothers and sisters have already highlighted the importance of maintaining um, Article 13.2 so that our health care can be properly funded, um, I would like to provide a, a different perspective on uh, the collegiate calendar. Um, as a teacher, having taught AP and IB courses, um, when I first thought about the idea of a collegiate calendar so that I could prepare my students with a little more extra time prior to that, that huge culminating exam in May, um, knowing an earlier start would give me you know, a whole month of extra, extra time to cover curriculum, maybe even review, I thought, great. 
A true collegiate calendar ending the fall term in December with final exams prior to the holiday break. No more reviewing in January to keep the kids refreshed so that they uh, can get ready for finals a month later. Um, I thought that would be great. But moving the start of the school year two weeks earlier with a fall semester that will have to be shortened in order to wrap it up by December, a spring semester that has to be lengthened, um, then the question is, how does the teacher of a semester-long course square that circle? Um, that's two weeks less in the fall, two weeks extra in the spring. That's a four-week differential in seat time. If a high school teacher teaching health, government, econ, um, those are just a few of the classes that will not be able to provide an, an equal educational opportunity to their fall students versus their spring students. Um, the proposed collegiate calendar, I think, creates many more challenges than it potentially solves. Um, sorry about that, lost my place. Um, and therefore, I think, honestly, I was a supporter of the collegiate calendar until the actual nuts and bolts were unveiled, and I thought it needs to either be all in or leave it alone. Um, but furthermore, the way in which the calendar adoption process has been presented to the community um, has been incredibly deceptive and dishonest. Uh, as a Newport Mesa parent, I received the email earlier this year giving the impression that the collegiate calendar was a done deal. My neighbors who have students in the district thought it was a done deal. But as a Newport Mesa teacher who actually pays attention to such things, I knew that NMFT needed to be partnering in the agreement and I informed my neighbors as such and they thought, well, why would we be told that we were switching to this calendar when it hasn't been agreed upon? Good question. I know the answer. They knew the answer, but uh, they weren't willing to say it out loud. Um, yeah. So are we being treated in partners in this decision? or are we being treated as adversaries? And I think the fact that we're here this evening in the numbers that we are in response to this latest, best, and final offer, that should inform your answer. Thank you. Nicholas, Nicholas, can I, there's one more teacher, there's one more teacher, can I put him in before you? Thank you. Bob Servin? Yeah, Bob. Bob, you're on. Thank you. Nicholas, thank you. Now, um, thank nice you. to see all of you here tonight. Um, I wasn't going to speak and then listening. I was just here to kind of see how it was going. Um, as far as the collegiate calendar, the parents and the students and the teachers don't want it. That's the bottom line. And, and what I've learned is that it's almost a move made in regards to um, the situation that happened at Crone Del Mar with the student that had committed suicide and stress and anxiety was brought up as the reason he did that. And so now we think by starting school earlier and ending it before Christmas break, uh, that will make things better for all the students. The kids are fine. That's not a problem for the students. The problem starting school in August is that you are going to have, as John mentioned, a 79-day first semester and a 101-day second semester. That's ludicrous. If you asked anybody, there's 180 days, how do you split it up in two semesters? It's 90-90. <laughs> but, but not with this. It doesn't seem that that's happening. The contract offer also seems from what I've read, and I talked to Leona on the phone in the summertime and had a very good conversation with her. Easy to talk to. We kind of gave information back and forth. She doesn't know me, but it was really a positive phone call to talk with her. Um, the contract offer seems to be a form of blackmail. You do this, and then we'll do this for you. And that's, that's not right. Um, we're told how well we're all paid. I've been in the district, this is my 34th year of teaching in the district. And, and I, I hear how well we're all paid, and so it was finally today that I decided to go on a website to see how well all the district administrators are paid. And, and the teachers and the classified, the secretaries, they're the ones 
doing the hard work. And I would invite any one of the board members to come out and look at the working conditions of our PE office at Costa Mesa High School. None of you would work in that. You would not work in it. Our locker room, disgusting. But we still go to work every day and collaborate every, after every period, our staff, to try and make things better for the kids. Um, and just uh, when, when this is being forced on us, and I know that there's going to be a bill signed by <laughs> Governor Newsom, I hate saying those words, that school is going to start at 830 in the next few years, that that will be the start date of public schools in California, in all of California. I, I just find this, this whole contract thing, collegiate calendar, to be completely bogus. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Good evening. Um, at the last board meeting, I brought forward some concerns that we had about um, information that we had requested from the superintendent. And I told you that we had not received it. I sent all of you an email the next day saying that we, in fact, had. So I apologize for, um, for um, being so um, upset and so um, angry about um, the lack of information. I have to tell you that, um, and you've seen the response, that I'm still not happy about the quality of the response. We've heard a lot tonight about the lack of communication, the lack of information, the lack of getting answers beforehand. We've heard it from current board members. We've heard it from previous board members. We, in fact, have had lawsuits in this district regarding the district's failure to provide even California public records. So at some point, this has to stop. We really want to get the information. You're required to give us the information so that we can represent our members and that we can protect our bargaining unit work. I also want to say that tonight I am so proud that we have so many teachers, counselors, certificated employees here in a showing of force that we are prepared to fight for the contract that we deserve. We are very proud. We're mighty. This is just but a small representation. We've been in meetings throughout the district with our members, and we're really committed to standing up for the contract that we deserve. We want to have a salary. We want to have benefits and working conditions that we earn every day. Thank you. Okay, Wendy Lees. And then Esmeralda Gamboa. Good evening, um, board president, superintendent, and members of the board. My name is Wendy Lees. Um, I've been speaking before the board for almost 35 years. I started in the mid 80s. But tonight, I really, my heart goes out to the teachers. I'm a parent, I'm a grandparent, I'm also an educator, as you know, at College Hospital. And many, some of the students that, that, are, that come to College Hospital have been in the Newport Mesa classes, but never have I been so disappointed in a school board, and I don't think I've ever recalled when teachers and the school board ha are in such an adversarial situation. Our teachers today, work so much harder than the teachers when I started coming to the board in the 80s. They have to be mental health experts. They have to parent. They have to be nurses. They have to have great discernment. They have to decide what kind of learning style each kid has. It's, it's, you, you, I'm in the classroom myself, and I understand and have great empathy. I encourage you, this isn't what I was really going to say tonight, I'll try and get my other items in, to reconcile the differences that you have with these amazing teachers who, who have so much on their plate, plus their families to take care of. I am ashamed of you for causing this division. 
that, that should have been resolved because of your respect and appreciation for teachers. The other thing, you just voted on a lot of money to go to uh, your directors and, and assistant superintendents and so on. Do you know that that is not itemized online? Those 220,000, 100 and, and just 57, 226, that, that is, an, the public cannot see that. And that is really why I'm here. Tonight, there were a couple comments where somebody said, let the, the world can't hear you. Um, and that young lady did a great job, by the way. For the public to know, why don't you live stream these meetings so that our communities can know what you are voting on and how much it costs. I am a taxpayer for almost 50 years and I have a right to, to know what you're talking about. No one knows. You have to figure it out on YouTube uh, several weeks later. The city live streams, other districts live stream. Talk about transparency. You give us these, these things for free. Where is it live streaming on here? that you can go on tonight instead of having to stay to, you can watch from home. Why don't you do that? Why aren't you transparent? So that everybody can know about Estancia and the $32 million or however much it's gonna spend. Thank you. Thank you. Just for the edification of the public and the board members know, uh, we have to uh, translate everything. We cannot live stream. It's a violation of federal law to do so. Unless, unless it's some live. The law has translate. changed. Laguna Beach is doing it. <coughs> you mean they're right? No, the ADA law changed. Did not. Oh. Okay, next person. Esmeralda Gamboa. She had to go to work. Thank you. Chuck Swain. And then Luke Drew. Good evening. Mm -hmm. um, I'm here as a parent of three flowing through the district. Um, my oldest son started at Woodland in 2008. And God willing, my youngest son will graduate from Harbor in 2029. <laughs> so, Congratulations. Uh, yes. Been here a while. Um, I have to tell you, I'm, I'm pretty upset about the collegiate calendar survey. Um, I think a significant amount of money, time, and effort was spent on that survey, and the results seem to have been completely ignored. Um, the same as now option, the same as now option uh, was the overwhelming choice throughout the survey, yet the board is going on in the complete opposite direction, and I don't get that. Um, I find it alarming that the data is being completely dismissed. Um, it gives the distinct impression that the board is out of touch with the needs and wants of the community because that's what we told you we wanted. Um, the July 2nd email from uh, Fred Navarro, um, it, it blew right past the survey. It didn't even mention it. it the results uh, supported the status quo. So why aren't we doing that? Um, I just wanna know why the data is being ignored and what, what is the benefit for you to, to have it the way that you want it and not listen to the community. Thank you. Is Luke Drew still here? Okay, that was the husband of the lady that spoke earlier. So, oops, there's another one. No, that's not for Oh, that's for this one. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> this is for item number 20B, a request from the member of the community. Point of order, do I read my comments yeah. first? First, okay. This is a request which you made for the moving the community comments at the beginning of the meeting. Those of you that were here all night did see that many community comments were made. There's opportunities throughout the entire meeting for community comments. The order of the agenda, and I will take I'm a pretty good person to say if this was done, it was me, it was me. I agree, if I had somebody else to point a finger to, I would, but I don't. I felt that when we have late meetings like this, 
and we've had most of our meetings this year have been like this, that we need to address all the agenda items on the things where we have decisions to be made earlier in the meeting and meeting and information that we want to hear from the public that we cannot act upon can happen at the end of the meeting because we can't make decisions. And also, the board receives emails and the, anything that any one of us receives, we give to everyone else. So we receive information from the community all the time. That's my logic and reasoning on how the board is now. Right now, I would like to entertain, I would like to talk to the board and say, does, yes, and you're next. I will let you. Yeah, but you're next. I'm going to let you. Oh, no, I'm not going to not let you. You're there. I just am doing my part first just because. Oh, geez. What I'm asking to the board is, would you like from direction of the board to have an item on the next agenda to vote to move the non-agenda items earlier in the evening? For instance, Esmeralda Gamboa, who was on the list, she was to speak. She's the PTA president of Pomona. She works nights. She's not able to be here. She waited for two and a half hours. That's unacceptable. We need to move the agenda. Do I have any other? Board direction. This, this is this is a difficult um, issue. Uh, I realize that, but I uh, this is um, I think it's most important that we accomplish the business that's on the agenda first. Now, sometimes it's not an issue, um, w but lately our meetings, and I think our meetings will continue to get longer. And uh, we have been here. We mm -hmm. have closed session first. It used to be that closed session was after. We have closed session first. We are here from 2 to 3 o'clock in the afternoon. until. So we're tired, too. Um, hey, um, audience, I'm we so, were very... I'm sorry. I'm trying... To... Yeah, really. I'm trying Thank to be you. respectful. I just want you to understand that this is a trustee, a board of education meeting. This is not a necessarily a community meeting. We, um, we have the meeting, you're here to observe and you're here to give input. And we love the input, we want the input from everyone. But I, I believe it's more important to get the input from, uh, fr uh, about what we are making a decision on first. And then if there are other issues that are not on the agenda and something that, that Ms. Matoye said, um, which is it's frustrating to me when, when people um, come and they want to talk about that, something that's not on the agenda and I can't talk about it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's like it's mm -hmm. very um, frustrating because I want to talk about it too, but I can't. I'm prevented from talking about it. So... When you come and you're able to stay and talk about and give this input or to request that something be put on the agenda, like the move, the moving of the, the public comments, that, that's much more helpful to me. So I would not um, disagree with putting it on the agenda to talk about. Mrs. Yelsey? I know you didn't um, think I was going there, but <laughs> I, I'm willing to talk about anything, <laughs> as um, you can see. <laughs> I agree with Mrs. Snell's comments. I would be willing to talk about it. And I think one thing we might want to consider is what is done at the, not that I approve of much of what's done at the county board, <laughs> but they do provide an opportunity, just 30 minutes at the beginning. Um, and maybe we could, yes. and that would be part of the discussion of, yeah. that's why I think we maybe should talk about we it, of splitting it so people who literally cannot stay for some reason 
could be first on the agenda, or maybe they get here first. I don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. um, and then, because I do think we have to do the business of the board for mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. first. But 30, 30, minute, 30 minutes maybe would be an acceptable period of time that we could allocate to non-agenda items and then finish it at the end of the meeting. Mrs. Floor? Um, I'm not opposed to anything, really, um, uh, but I think it's important to realize that, for example, at the county, it's 30 minutes, and then at they start the meeting at 10 o'clock, and at 10.30, sometimes they're going into closed session. And then the public has to sit and wait until they get out of closed session to even start the meeting, the regular meeting. So that's, that's one. Um, I've done some research on it. Uh, with in regards to some of our others, but I think the concept is that there needs to be a clear understanding of exactly what a board meeting is. And so I, I would hope that if we have the, the, the conversation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, at the next meeting, is that the, the clear conversation is that this is not a public forum and this is not a public meeting, that this is a meeting of the board conducting the business of the board in public. Uh, so often I get, uh, what I get frustrated is, um, and that's why I, I like this process. I know people are frustrated, but who do you prioritize? Those who have considerate concerns about the agenda or an agenda item, and those who are making presentations like our auditors or like tonight, our individual who, you know, our, our the facilities. Okay. I mean, who who do we prioritize? Those individuals, or do we prioritize the? How many do we have here tonight? Sixteen. Sixteen at three minutes apiece, which would would far exceed that. Who has priority? Those who are actually conducting and being making, helping us make decisions, or those who are coming to to, to that have a concern and want to express it. Mm -hmm. There is there is a there is a balance there. The issue becomes one of so often what is frustrating is somebody may come in and make a comment or a complaint that's not on the agenda, and what happens is mm -hmm. the it's made a present present, and then three minutes later, um, during we we try and schedule some opportunities for while we can't our superintendent or our staff are able to to make comments and cor clarify items, but guess what happens? Those individuals get up, say their piece, and walk out. Do not want to hear any information or get some additional facts, and we don't even have the opportunity to meet with them or to assign somebody to go out and say, can you just clarify that, because they get up and leave. I think that's really frustrating, and that's disrespectful, because if they really have a concern, they, wouldn't they want to have some sort of a dialogue? Everyone talks about wanting a dialogue and wanting to co collaborate, and yet how do you collaborate and how do you have communication when they get up and leave Sometimes en masse, they get up and leave before there is an even opportunity to, to meet Thank somebody you. out, out okay. the door. Um, again, um, I don't have a problem, but I think that we need to do some research. I've done some. For example, uh, Capistrano Unified has one opportunity to speak, and they have a 38-page agenda. So they have 30 minutes that they allow to speak at the very beginning, and then there's 38. There's 38. Uh, Huntington Beach allows for a five minute, 30 minutes, but if there are three people who want to speak on an item, they limit it to three minutes each. Again, a time certain of only 30 minutes. So which 30 people, which, wh how many people are allowed to speak, and then what happens to those other individuals? We have three opportunities to speak. We have a closed session opportunity. They can speak on anything on closed session. They can speak on uh, consent. Consent. They discussion can action. discussion action. And, and actually, at the end, so they have four resolutions. resolutions. So Those they have five. actually four or five opportunities to speak within within this this the board uh, this, the board the board uh, um, our board. Other districts have one, maybe two. So I'm willing to think, but I think we need to do some additional research on exactly what, what others. If we're willing to limit it to 30 minutes for the entire time and there's no other public discu discussion, works for me. That's 30 minutes. Okay, but we're we would discuss the whole 
next thing time. Okay. next yeah. time. Yeah. So, do I have consensus of the board to put this on the agenda for the next yes. one? Uh, not really, but that's okay. Well, <laughs> I don't have consensus. Do I have a majority of the board members? Yes. Yes. I would okay. That you have Mrs. O'Meara. <clears throat> Well, I brought this up for Many years, times. and I've also spoken at this group for like 20 years. Tonight, I'm spending $100 to have somebody take care of my husband at home. I really don't I am appreciate too. having to come I'm having at this hour. So pay for my mother so, as well. Um, and also, in response to Martha, no, I am. You're also Ladies, you're also O'Meara. paid. Mrs. O'Meara has the floor. Martha, I've already commented on your comment that you said I walked out on you, but I listened at your, uh, you know. I didn't you, say you. Just, we don't I, wa I, I listened sorry. to the comments at home on what you said. I, on the many times I have spoken here, I bet I have had twice that any, <coughs> any member of the board has ever called or contacted me again. So, I'm the one that requested this. It's finally agreed to put it on the agenda and it was supposed to be placed on a discussion and vote. That's what you told me when you emailed me. Allowing public's comments at the beginning of the meeting has been in effect for over 25 years. Mrs. Matoya agreed that she changed it without uh, confirming with the other uh, trustees, which I thought was strange. That doesn't mean I didn't have to Her reasoning it. was that the board <laughs> needed to concentrate on agenda items. Many parents and well-known members of the public have advocated a return to the former policy. You've seen it many mentions in the paper. At the September board meeting, six high school representatives were allowed to speak at the beginning of the meeting without a time limit. The board learned from each member that school had started, that there had been a few athletic activities and social events at their school. The PTA president also got to tell you about their new PTA plans. None of this was timed. The high school students were allowed to leave right after they had spoken. And it was time to go home and do their homework and go to bed. At the September meeting, public speakers waited four hours to make their three minute comments. There were 13 requests to speak. Many of them had left by 10 o'clock when they finally would have been allowed to speak. Most of those speakers were teachers that felt they had something important they wanted to tell the trustees. Tonight, you have the same thing. All these teachers are here when they should be doing home, doing the paperwork and planning for these two new curriculums that take a lot of work. Instead, they're here. Thank you, teachers. Trustees. <laughs> Trustees, why do you think the teachers of the voting public comments are less important than the six high school students and the PTA president's comments? Vote tonight to move the public comments or 30 minutes would be fine with me. 30 minutes, you don't get 30 minutes of comments ever. So 30 minutes. We had minutes. Eight, 80 today. 80 minutes. 80 minutes tonight. tonight. Okay. Just in 16 Well, minutes. tonight's Wait. an exception. Stop, stop. Sorry. <laughs> Mrs. O'Meara, you should have more time because you were interrupted. Yes, you were interrupted. That's okay. Sorry. I've I'm had sorry. enough time in this whole <laughs> Okay. Board member reports. Um, I'm going to start. That'll make it easier for everybody. Um, I'm passing out agenda prep schedules and the latest, uh, latest and greatest board meeting oh. calendar for you for your Thank you. reading approval. I also wanted to make comment before you guys run away. There's a really great new brochure put out by our public information office and. CSEA, they're talking about inspiring students and enriching communities. It's a really great brochure. I like it. There's another one out there on the signature academies. Instead of having one on every single academy, it's all put into one piece of paper. Thank you, Mrs. They're Franco so, and, so and Ariana. There you it's are. wonderful. So, so polite. Adriana, I just said your name wrong. Okay. Um, I had a really interesting CIF meeting for my very first position. One of the things I wanted to bring back to us is that the CIF board is making policy on what to do, consistent implementation of what to do when a parent, when a student, then coaches and then parents do benching offenses. 
it took me a while to ask what that was. <laughs> it's like the yellow card at a soccer game or in basketball. Hold on, they're leaving, so hold on. Well, they don't, this, they're, they don't. It's, they're not noise. I can't hear. Oh, you can't hear. I'm sorry, I can't hear. I'm sorry, I thought. I can't okay. hear. <laughs> they're quiet. No, no. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. If, and a benching offense is like the yellow card or for basketball, it'd be if you jumped and grabbed onto the rim and it was things to do that were not fighting offenses. So I got clarification on that and there's three levels of what happens. And then fighting offenses, there's three levels of that. To me, there shouldn't be any levels, it's fighting. But I was one of probably about 80 people. And then similar things for coaches. I thought that was an excellent step for them. I think it will help a lot of our high schools because we have something from the state to lean back on when sometimes when you're telling someone this is what we're doing, it's why? Because the state CIF says this is what we do. So it was a fascinating meeting. I'm excited to be on it. And next report. Oh, oh you want me to? Sure, we'll go right down. Mrs. Snell can be last. Um, one to congratulate on the consent calendar tonight was Maria Barragan, who was yes. one of our community facilitators, who has now been hired as a social worker. Social worker. Mm -hmm. So she's now moved from the classified side to the certificated side. So I want to congratulate her on that opportunity. That's terrific. Um, Kirk <coughs> mentioned the Hall of Fame. It was terrific. Um, and the reason it's been moved was because they are now going to be in conjunction with homecoming. So right. that's, that's the process and they're very excited about that. Amazing awardees that are continuing to be unbelievable um, supporters of, of the school and of our community. Uh, Mary Lyons, one of the teachers, was an English teacher at Newport Harbor, but she has um, turned her focus on to the arts and has been a very strong supporter of the arts. Um, the State of the Schools was a great event. Again, I think the kids were terrific. And then Shar and I had an opportunity to attend the drama production at Behind the Curtain um, at Newport Harbor High School, and it was a first because it was a collaboration between professional artists and actors and um, students. And so three of our students um, were able to work with Orson Bean, who is 93, I think, yeah. <laughs> and his wife, uh, uh, Audrey Mills, who now goes by Audrey Bean, and two additional uh, legit Allie. actors, Allie Bean. Allie Bean. Um, phenomenal. Um, there's hope that they're going to continue to do it. Uh, the WASC was fabulous, and then Back Bay High School had um, a wonderful, wonderful um, back to school night. Lots of families there that, that day. And then there is coming up in April a mental health um, conference in Anaheim. Um, so I'm hoping that some of our staff can, can go to that. And that's my report. Um, yes, ditto to a lot, but. Um, in particular, I want to thank the students um, for the um, state of the school breakfast. I, you know, th their enthusiasm <laughs> at 6.30 in the morning was phenomenal, or 6.15 in the morning for some of them. Um, and they just, you know, they were really grateful, and I loved hearing all of their speeches. And um, so I hope that we incorporate more of our students in the presentation, because they really did a, a Really great job, and the wasp was wonderful. And and you know I've been to a lot of wasps presentations, and um, and I just this team was amazing. Maybe because they couldn't say enough nice things about our staff, and the people you know um, support staff. You know not just our teachers, but the, you know the nurses. They met with um, counselors like Dr. Navarro shared. You know they just were um, really actually very articulate, better than I'm doing at this late hour, but um, about exactly how they were treated and they really appreciated that. And um, and like, you know, Mrs. Floor was saying, they really did a um, real diverse group of students that they took time with and had patience with. And so um, I was just really impressed and, and grateful for that. And the homecoming, um, I live across from Newport Harbor uh, Field and, uh, it's always a pleasure because our, our whole street, our neighbors and everything, everyone is so polite and excited and we were out there rooting 
you know, behind the scenes because we didn't want to take up bench seats, but, um, but it was just wonderful and we couldn't be more excited for them. So thanks for that. Yeah, I just wanted to bring up safety, safety in general at our schools. And a couple of weeks ago, uh, there were events that occurred at Corona Del Mar High School that made the news. Um, and some of these events occur at other schools every day. They don't make the news. But at Corona Del Mar, when something happens, it, it makes, makes the, the news. news. <laughs> and I just want to say to everybody that safety is the primary importance to everyone sitting up here for all our students and our staffs on our campuses. And that's why we spend so much time talking about fencing, why our student services spend so much time talking about mental health and wellness and threat assessments and everything we do. And we don't talk about it all the time. And I really want to commend the staff at Corona Del Mar at the PTA meeting last week, both the middle school high school principal, Gary Clemente, the school resource officer, uh, other groups on campus that are involved with student wellness spoke and talked to the parents about what is done. And a lot of this the public doesn't see because they don't go around talking about every risk assessment that is done with, with students. And there are a lot that no one knows about. And what's done involvement with the police, with the FBI, with OCIAP, with other groups that need to be involved. And I think it's just a message that we want our parents to know <laughs> that we take safety really seriously. And we want the parents to trust our schools when they're there because they are at a one call notice out wherever something happens. And they're all, you know, with our SROs, with our <clears throat> security officers, with teachers, with counselors on campus all the time. They, I think they do a terrific job of helping keep our kids safe. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Sanders. I love to see the gate, that there are more gate teachers that are being trained at Adams, and I would love to see that opened up across the district through Orange County Department of Ed. Those trainings are really inexpensive. I would love to have it just be an open call for our district's teachers to be able to attend that if they would like. Um, we know that, that it, it benefits um, everything, including ELD instruction, a lot of gate strategies or SADI strategies are combined. Please open it up next time for all of our district teachers to take that. Um, I really would like more, some kind of um, a report or understanding more about the skate park, not from Measure F bond money, but from some of our district money if we're having partnerships. Um, and then I also was able to go to the Educational Equity Conference in Long Beach with several mm -hmm. board members, which I'm so thankful that so several of you were able to attend. Um, I went to one that was on ensuring equity and early childhood um, education, which literally was talking about new proposed legislation about what we would do for dual language instruction for preschoolers, which is really exciting. So that was awesome. Um, and I went to one that was on recruiting, sorry, it was, yeah, it was recruiting and reta reta retaining male teachers of color and respecting diversity. Um, and then another one that was caring for needs of undocumented students in an age of urgency. So that was wonderful. And then the next day I was able to go to the first five conference that um, was held in, which where was that, Orange? Um, leaders today, learners today, leaders tomorrow. And it was mm -hmm. talking, there were a lot of people that were there, they don't have access to the EDI data that we have. There's a woman from Inglewood that she had never even heard of it and she was on the school board. So there's a lot of pieces that I feel like we are uniquely gifted with because we have so many resources in Newport Mesa. Um, and so to continue to build on that preschool through 12 educational experience. Mrs. Bartow. I'll make my um, school part short since I have the legislative report and I'll combine. Um, I also attended the Ed Equity um, Ed Trust West Conference. It was really great. There were some um, great ways of approaching data and uh, since we're very data driven, it was helpful to see how other school districts had approached similar problems. Um, some ideas that hopefully we can bring back. Additionally, I went to the first uh, Newport Harbor home football game with my kids. That was really, really fun. <laughs> um, they said 
that they didn't realize that sports weren't boring now that they saw them in person. So I think I'm doing a bad job um, at home with that. Um, but they did enjoy the, the game. So my legislative report, and then I went to Ensign's open house and Newport Harbor's open house and a couple other elementary open, back to school, thank you, back to school nights besides. Um, my legislative updates are, um, the main one that passed through is the charter school legislation AB 1505 that went through both the assembly and the Senate, but um, and that was actually signed by Governor mm -hmm. Newsom. A lot of the other ones are that we have been following and paying attention to are still sitting on um, wait, awaiting signature. So the uh, AB 1505 is charter school legislation. As I said, it's very very different than initially proposed. It's really complicated and. Um, it doesn't, even experts are not exactly sure what it's going to do in the end. It does give a little bit more local control, but then the appeals process, which was part of it, has been reduced. So that's you know not what we hoped, and we'll have to see how um, precedent affects the way that law is interpreted. Um, other ones that are coming up are the school start times, uh, SB 328, that one is still awaiting um, signature, that one uh, CSBA is opposed to because of local control, um, however PTA is for it because of mental health, you can make your own choices <laughs> of what you think. Um, then the other ones that are coming up are AB 751, which would allow schools to provide other assessments besides the SAT or the ACT for 11th grade students um, in place of the SBAC, for example. Um, there's a public preschool K through 12 health and safety bond act coming through that would provide a 15 billion facilities bond. Again, that's awaiting signature. Um, then the one that will probably affect us the most if it's if it goes through is related to LCFF funding and LCAP uh, requirements. Those are again changing the way the format of how that will be. That's um, AB 967 and AB 39. Again, those are still awaiting signatures, so we'll see how they go through. Um, our student board members are really important to us. Um, they, they don't start, I think last meeting was their first meeting. So um, their reports get a little more detailed um, as they um, learn about um, what we're kind of we're looking for, but we do enjoy hearing about their sports and their dances and it's it's a real connection for us to the students and I think it's it's a learning experience for them to sit here and listen to um, what goes on here, although many times they do have to leave early, they have to study for tests and really how long can a teenager take this? <laughs> you know an hour is about it, you know, but um, I do notice the longer as they progress through the year, um, they get much more outgoing and they're even, they're able to, to input on anything that we're talking about. So I think it's really an important program. Uh, we don't ha really have to worry about them going on too long because they're, um, yeah, they pretty much do the report <laughs> in under three minutes. And um, as a former um, Harbor Council PTA president, it's, it's crucial to have the PTA president here to give their report because they interact with all the PTA presidents throughout the district. And that partnership is really, really important. We have a partnership with the, the parent information nights. And so um, that I just felt, I'm not defending the fact that they uh, have unlimited amount of time to speak, but I, I think they're really important. And um, it's important that they're part of the meeting. And that is, I did to attend the equity conference and it was really great. I think everybody here attended it and um, it was wonderful to be able to sit in the, in the classes, the workshops and discuss as a, not any decisions we were making, but just discuss the concepts of um, what we're doing right, what we can improve on, and um, very informative. So that's it. And we brought back, for the board members that weren't able oh, to yeah. attend, we brought back copies of the EL roadmap 
Did you get yours, Michelle, that day? I couldn't remember because I knew you so had to get them. the kids. There's, four, there are four of them, but three were brought to the meeting for middle, elementary school, middle school, and high school so that we can familiarize ourselves with it and so we know what we're asking from our teachers. Mm -hmm. um, so we brought back copies for everything, and we also brought back a little thumb drive that you have some extra ones of, I have two with me, of all the presentations that were there and all of the um, PowerPoint presentations so that we can share with you that. So we've got those. If we don't have them today in our little bags, those of you that weren't here and didn't get one, we've got those for you. Um, Mrs. Fleur, crop report? Sure. Um, in the next meeting um, after our uh, Carol Hume will be coming here and on the next meeting agenda will be the the new agreement so that's coming but just wanted to let you know that last year we had 30 courses that were approved last year for a through F a through G requirements this year as of um, last month we had 62 that are a through G uh, approved there's five more that are pending and seven that are in preparation uh, some of the new approvals are all the nursing assistant pre-certification courses and all dental courses, all public service courses, uh, such as fire science, emergency medical technician, um, which is EMR, emer um, emer emergency medical responder. Um, and then we're also working very uh, hard with Anita Salazar with developing partnerships and so we've uh, we have some new ad additional articulation agreements where the kids can earn college credit um, and that's automotive technology um, MLR1 and MLR2 and architectural design one and arch and and two are now articulated and are UCI approved so kids can go to the automotive technology they can sign up it's at Orange uh, Coastline Community College and the arch architectural uh, design ones are th um, through also one of the community colleges so that's really um, really excited um, the CTIG grants we're still trying to figure out what the hell they're doing up at the state I mean that's the bottom Sorry. line it was supposed to be released on September 16th and due in November but it, it's still waiting. It hasn't come out yet, has it? <laughs> nope, they keep changing it. Um, and they're working to shorten the application. And the, the K-12 Strong Workforce is supposed to be getting released in October, but who knows when that one's going to be happening. Um, and so we did find out that uh, the two-year bill that Patrick O'Donnell was um, sponsoring, the reason was that it didn't get passed was because the, the assembly loved it and was ready to sign it. And we're very aligned with the public school um, mm -hmm. K-12. The Senate, on the other hand, wants to keep it in the higher education. They're much more aligned with the, the community colleges and that's why there's a, there was the battle and so that's why it, it's now stalled and it'll be a two year bill. So that's my report. Thank you. A motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you. Second. 1029. Thank you so much, everybody who stayed.